Margo. All right, City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes. Council Member Soria. Council Member Carbasi. Here. Council Member Arias. Present. Council, Council Member Kalagarin. Okay, one second. Council Member Maxwell. Present. Council Member Bredefeld. Council Vice President Esparza. Present. And Council President Chavez. Here. Uh, next, we'll have the invocation by Reverend Reagan Baker of the Big Red Church. I believe uh, Council Member Arias invited him. If he could come up. Everybody, please stand. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, I pray from the Christian tradition, but with uh, sensitivity to those of other faiths or if you would please join me in a spirit of prayer. Dear holy and loving God, this morning we thank you for your abundant blessings and provision. We thank you for the gift of life and its renewal in every sacred breath we take. We thank you for the communities and the city in which we live and the unique diversity that enriches it. We thank you also for challenging and meaningful work, in particular the work of governing this city with and on behalf of its people. To be given such work is a high task and a unique grace. Today we pray for each other, for every single one of our neighbors, for everyone engaged in this work, and in particular this council. Today we pray for a commitment to justice and equality for all, for wisdom to govern amidst competing interests and complex issues, for the ability to disagree with respect and to build more together than we can on our own, and a mindfulness and compassion for every one of our neighbors who struggle to attain the basic necessities of food, water, clothing, and shelter. We pray for today's agenda and invite you into this council's work and discernment and decisions to bring about an increasingly just and flourishing Fresno and eventually world. By the na many names we call you, we pray for these things in your name, together. Amen. Thank you for that. If you could please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. Reverend, uh, City Clerk, for the benefit of the public, could you read the changes to the agenda? Yes. Um, Council Vice President Esparza would like to adjourn the meeting in memory of Mo Baganu. And the following are the changes to the agenda. The following items are being requested to be pulled from the agenda with no return date. File ID 21-22972. Item 1V as in Victor, as a resolution in support of the Northwest Fresno Sierra Sky Park is being requested to be removed from the agenda with no return date by Council Member Carbasi. File ID 21-22975, item 1Y, approve an agreement with Wallace, Robert, and Todd is being requested to be removed from the agenda and continue to July 29th by Council Member Carbasi and the department However, Councilmember Maxwell has requested for the item to be removed indefinitely. Uh, the following items are being requested to be pulled from the agenda to a future date. File ID 21-22917, item 1W, bill related to taxing aircraft and parking of aircraft and other vehicles on public streets in Sierra Sky Park is being requested to be removed from the agenda and continue to July 29th by Councilmember Carbasi and the department. File ID 21-22953, item 1X. Action item 1X, Jody Hagee, Mute. 
actions pertaining to uh, our actions pertaining to resolution of intent to vacate a portion of West Spatz Avenue and North Doolittle Drive between North Blythe Avenue and West Herndon Avenue is being requested to be removed from the agenda to July 29th by Council Member Carbasi and the department. The following items are being requested to be pulled from the consent calendar and moved to contested consent for further discussion. File ID 21-22919, item 1I, reject all bids for the Fresno Area Express Wi-Fi pilot program is being requested to be pulled to contested consent by Council Member Maxwell. File ID 21-22792, Dash zero one, bill relating to massage businesses is being requested to be pulled to contested consent by Council Member Maxwell. File ID 21-22872, item 1N, as in Nancy, actions pertaining to housing stability service contracts related uh, contracts through the Emergency Rental Assistance Program is being requested to be pulled to contested consent by Council Member Maxwell. Item File ID 21-22924, item 1R, actions pertaining to the City of Fresno's Local Housing Trust Fund is being requested to move to contested consent by Council Member Maxwell. Item 1S, as in Sam, file ID 21-2276, approved contract change order number one to Durham Construction is being requested to be moved to contested consent by Council Member Arias. And those are all the changes. Thank you for that, Clerk. So just in summary, I've got item 1V, 1Y, 1W, 1X being removed, and I've got items 1I, 1M, 1N, and 1R uh, moved from con from consent to and contested consent. And 1S. And 1S. Council President. Yes, Council Member. I just wanted to remark briefly on the item that I continued indefinitely. That's 1Y contract for WRT. Mm -hmm. I would just like to request that administration meet with the parks um, committee before bringing it back um, onto the agenda. If that happens to be the next council meeting, that's fine. But I wanted to leave it indefinite in case we don't have the chance to do it before the next council meeting. Yeah. Can, right. I, can I respond? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Because um, we're still in a timing sequence with the parks commission. So we presented this to them on Monday. And they hadn't seen it yet, so we said, hey, tell you what we're doing. We're going to pull it off of the agenda today, because that's what we want to do. We want to pull it off the agenda today. So we're going to meet with them on Monday, the, the 19th. I think we'll meet with them. We'll go through the contract with them and everything, and then we'll bring it back to you guys with a recommendation from them. So their recommendation right now was, hey, can you guys pull it? Because we haven't seen it yet. And the reason we wanted to pull it was because the, um, the ordinance is very clear that one of their duties is to recommend to council updates to the master plan. And that contract is to update the master plan. So they thought, and we thought the same thing, which is the timing thing with them. So I appreciate that. Duly noted, City Manager. Thank you. All right. Uh, are there any other items that council members want to pull? Council Member Carbasi? Uh, on that item 1Y, I actually uh, did not request to remove that. I think what happened was in the preliminary agenda, 1Y was actually what 1B is now, the Sky Park item. So just for the record. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Council Member Soria, do you have any items to pull, Vice President? Yeah, let's go ahead. I don't have any changes to the actual agenda, but since we're doing the um, consent uh, items, I'll go ahead and ask that item 1O is moved from the consent agenda to contested consent. That's 1O. Okay. Council Member Arias, any items? No changes. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. All right. Second. Uh, Motion was made by Council Member Arias. Second, uh, any, actually, do we have any abstentions or any recusals? I'm gonna recuse myself from item 1L. Um, any other abstentions or recusals or any other items? Seeing none, with that being read into the record, item made by Council, uh, motion made by Council Member Arias, seconded by Vice President Sparsa. Any opposition? Seeing none, agenda is approved. All right, let's go on to ceremonial presentations. Uh, Councilwoman Soria, I believe you have a proclamation for Mr. Patrick Boyd Day. Floor is yours.
So good morning, everyone. It is actually great to see folks in the audience. Um, thank you um, for the folks that are watching. Um, this is a special proclamation um, for Mr. Boy Boyd here this morning. Um, on behalf of the city of Fresno, our entire council, and the mayor, we did want to recognize you today for the tremendous work that you have um, dedicated and volunteered as being part of the city of Fresno's Historic Preservation Commission. Um, so thank you, Patrick, um, for the work that you have done as being part of the commission, but also as a chairman. I believe that you served for three um, consecutive terms. Um, and so we want to really recognize the work that he has done over those terms um, to improve the historic preservation of buildings um, here in our community. I know that you guys have done a lot of work over the last few years. Um, you have definitely have left a mark in the city of Fresno through the commission, but also through what you do um, privately as an award-winning landscape architect. Um, so you've provided a lot of input and um, designs um, through your work at Design Lab 252 and also the California Department of Transportation. Um, right now, you're also, I know, very involved with the Fresno um, Arts Council, which is a critical organization um, that supports arts in our community. We know that it is vital for um, economic um, vitality as well. So we want to thank you for the work um, that you've committed over the time at the Fresno Historic Preservation Commission, um, but also for the work that you will continue to do with the Arts Council. Um, you will, I, I'm certainly, um, Confident you will be missed by your other commissioners because of the work that you've been doing, but we do thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Uh, it's truly been an honor to be part of uh, the community through the Arts Council first and then the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, uh, commissions like this, when you reach out and participate in the community, give back more than you have to give. So I encourage everyone to find something that they love and join up. So, Madam Clerk, if we could read the proclamation for the record. Yes. Whereas Patrick Boyd is an award-winning landscape architect who has brought over 23 years of industry experience in all aspects of landscape architecture to the area design 252. Today we honor Patrick's efforts and contributions as chair of the City of Fresno Historic Preservation Commission. During his tenure with the Historic Preservation Commission, he has had the opportunity to list many structures to the historic database, help residents with historic properties, and list new districts. As chair for three year terms, he has enjoyed the privilege of leading meetings for a strong and knowledgeable board. And whereas Patrick Boyd is known to take the initiative in any complex, large-scale agency or commercial project. Numerous organizations have recognized Patrick for his high aesthetic and design and water conservation achievements. He has high experience in transportation design, spending almost a decade at California Department of Transportation, notably with his authorship of sections of the Beautification Master Plan of Highway 99. And whereas Patrick Boyd leaves his mark on the city of Fresno with his arts and historic preservation leadership. He was president of the Fresno Arts Council and is currently vice president. He first joined to promote public arts for all Fresnans to enjoy. Outside of his own professional opportunities, he promoted art and art programs within the community, expanding access for all. And whereas we honor Patrick Boyd for his abundance of work in architecture and preservation in the city of Fresno, we thank Patrick Boyd for his many years of service to the Fresno and his people. Now therefore be it resolved that the city of Fresno mayor and the city council hereby proclaim July 15th to be Patrick Boyd Day. Thank you for your years of service, uh, Mr. Boyd, and congratulations on the proclamation. We will now move on to council member reports and comments. Uh, let's give Councilwoman Soria a couple minutes to get back up, and we'll start in numerical order. Councilwoman Soria, do you have any reports or comments you'd like to report up? Yes, thank you, Council President. Just want to make some quick announcements uh, for the community. We are going to be hosting a community meeting on the 21st um, regarding the Echo Weldon Park. This has been an issue that in that neighborhood we've been talking for a number of years now with resources and most recently with the budget. 
Um, we are talking about design phase and um, what that corner will look like. So we want to invite folks to come out on Wednesday, July 21st, 21st at um, 6 p.m. Um, to talk about um, the Echo and Weldon um, proposed city park. Also just um, want to thank folks that came out. We had our first in-person community meeting um, specifically on an issue related to a bodega um, and a deli that is coming to the Fresno High neighborhood. We had a pretty good turnout. I think about 60 people showed up. Um, so just want to thank folks for wanting to be involved in the community and providing your input. So thank you. All right, Councilmember Carbasi, do you have any reports? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, on a somber note, I, I would request that we adjourn in memory of John Horseman Sr. Uh, he's a District 2 resident, uh, former Leon S. Peters Award recipient. Um, he received, President Castro awarded him the Presidential Medal uh, at Fresno State, and um, unfortunately, he did pass. Uh, also a lifelong Rotarian and member of the Chamber, and I know some of my colleagues knew him as well. On a, on a great note, um, there's a household name that isn't quite household yet, and that is Jalen Green. Jalen Green was born in Merced, but played basketball at uh, San Joaquin Memorial. He is going to be the next number one NBA player in this nation. And uh, ESPN ranked him as the number one pick uh, for the draft, and the draft will take place uh, July 29th. But he hasn't even started yet, and he's already giving back. And I'm so incredibly impressed. He used to play basketball, at Collegian Park, which is in District 2, and he's partnered with Adidas and Project Backboard, who have been amazing to work with the administration and parks, uh, mayor's office, and myself to be able to really uh, give a whole facelift to the park, and there's going to be a ceremony on Saturday at 1 p.m., any members of the public that want to attend, um, and I think Jalen might just be there. So uh, thank you so much, Jalen. Your mom is very proud of you, uh, as we are in this city, and I just really appreciate you're not even, I mean, you're a star, but you're, you're not even like a millionaire yet, and you're already giving back to the community, but you will be, and, and I appreciate uh, this kind gesture. It's a big deal. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Radias. Thank you, Council President. Uh, just quick informational, um, I invite everyone to attend the St. Rest Community event that's taking place Saturday, July 24th at 3 p.m. It will also include uh, free vaccinations for those who have not yet been vaccinated. Uh, we also wanted to uh, informed the, the community this afternoon um, at 6 p.m. actually this evening at 6 15 p.m. we'll be having uh, the third public update on the redistricting process for the city of Fresno and in that meeting we will be outlining our outreach plan to ensure that um, as many people as possible participate in the community process on the redistricting plan that will include a meeting in South Fresno in Central Fresno and in North Fresno as part of our aggressive outreach plan so I I invite everyone to attend this evening at 6.15 p.m. in these chambers as we uh, go through detail on our outreach plan and the redistricting process. I also want to uh, express my thanks to the community who's been extremely patient as we are engaged in our full rebuilding plan of District 3. Currently, the reconstruction of the roads in downtown are taking place. Thank you to Public Works. Uh, those have been completed. Now we're just waiting for the striping to finish up those roads. The roads in West Fresno around Mary Ellen Brown are also being repaved as we speak. So we're hoping that the restriping will also finish in the next few days. But be patient, we're gonna enter a window of two years where we are reconstructing and rebuilding a lot of our parts that, of the city that were left behind with the recently adopted budget by this council. And then finally, I just wanna welcome everyone back to these chambers. It's been probably a year and a half to two years before we've seen some faces in, in this uh, chamber. And um, I want to welcome everyone who's here to speak uh, their minds and address the council, and also specifically welcome folks from our homeless community who are here present today too. Um, like in every meeting over the last year and a half, we have a, an item that deals with homelessness, resources, and acquisition of more facilities to house those without homes. So it's critically important for us to have those individuals impacted by decisions to be here in person and hear from the administration and staff as we proceed with additional supports for our homeless residents. So welcome everyone and enjoy the day. All right, Council Member Maxwell. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Council President. And thank you for everybody joining us in the audience. This is actually my first council meeting where we actually have folks sitting in the audience. So nice to see everybody this morning. 
Uh, four brief updates. The first is um, next Saturday, July 24th from 8 to 10 a.m. We'll be uh, partnering up with Beautify Fresno to clean up around the Melody Park area around Shields and Fowler. We'll be providing snacks and food. Uh, we always clean up a ton of trash, and so anybody's able to make it, we'd love to have you out there that morning. Second update, we're on the second week of my office's Why I Ride contest. Essentially, we are trying to promote the fact that you could still get on any bus here in the city of Fresno, and it is still zero fare. Our buses are clean, they're safe, they're on time, and we want to get more people engaged with riding the bus. And so I'm giving away $100 every week for the month of July just to ride the bus. Take a selfie, tag me on social media, and we'll choose a winner every Sunday. We just gave away $100 towards uh, Doghouse Grill this last Monday. And this Sunday, we're going to pick another winner for $100 towards Maya Cinemas. So if you haven't ridden the bus, give it a try. If you ride the bus regularly, take a selfie, send it to me. You could win $100 this Sunday. Third update I wanted to touch upon was a thank you. Uh, some of you may know Detective Danny Kim. He's the pop officer for Northeast Fresno. Um, and he's put a lot of work into what we call the Yoda program. That stands for Youth Outreach Through the Arts. Every Thursday around 4 o'clock, Detective Danny Kim historically has got the El Dorado Park neighborhood kids out there at our mobile unit ran by the Parks Department to provide them dinner to provide them art supplies and get them engaged. And we were really pleased to see Detective Kim bring that back for the first time since the pandemic hit a couple weeks ago. We were able to partner with him to provide snacks, um, dinner and supplies for those kids. And we look forward to continuing that tradition every Thursday going forward. My last update, Council President, is in regards to my lawn rebate program. My office recently worked with the uh, Department of Public Utilities to start um, a rebate program. If you're interested in saving money on your water bill every month, if you're interested in saving the city water, if you want to help beautify your landscaping, my office is going to knock on every door in District 4 to try to get people signed up to convert their lawns into drought-tolerant landscaping. A lot of folks never fully um, recovered from the drought we had a few years back, and there's still a lot of blight in central Fresno. There's still a lot of people that struggle to pay their water bill every month. And so this is gonna really be a great step forward, saving people money, saving the city water, and beautifying our city. And while I'm gonna be focused on District 4, the program is available citywide for anybody interested. Thank you, Council President. All right, thank you, Councilmember Maxwell. Vice President Sparsa. Yes, thank you, Council President. Uh, it's good to be back uh, with uh, the public here in the building with us. A uh, few uh, updates. Uh, we had a very successful uh, Beautify Fresno cleanup event uh, a few weeks back on June 26th uh, in the Radio Park neighborhood. Uh, had uh, a good number of volunteers come out. Uh, so I want to thank all the volunteers who did uh, you know, spend their Saturday morning, a hot Saturday morning uh, with us, as well as uh, Public Works and all of our city staff who spent uh, a few days in that neighborhood uh, giving it uh, a facelift. Uh, so I think it was a successful event. All the Beautify Fresno events we've had in District 7 have, have gone uh, very well, and we look forward to, uh, to many more. Uh, in terms of upcoming events, uh, on July 29th, which is uh, the next council meeting, uh, Thursday, um, that evening from 4 to 7 p.m., we'll be having a Beat the Heat community event over at Romaine Park. Uh, so we encourage everyone in the community, especially the folks in the surrounding neighborhood, uh, to come out uh, for just a family-friendly event. We'll have food. Uh, water slide, uh, et cetera, lots of community partners out there. Uh, so it'll be uh, uh, outdoors, obviously, um, uh, fairly, uh, very safe uh, event. And so we encourage folks uh, to come on out. Uh, lastly, uh, as the clerk had mentioned, did want to uh, also adjourn today uh, at today's meeting in memory of Mo Baganu, <clears throat> who uh, was the general manager of, of the new Manchester, or, or as you might know it, uh, the Manchester Center. Uh, Mo is someone who shared my passion, <coughs> excuse me, who shared my passion for uh, the revitalization of the Blackstone Corridor. Uh, and he was also a member of the uh, Fresno EIFD Public Financing Authority. Uh, Mo played many uh, other roles throughout our Fresno community, uh, including with the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, he's already missed uh, by so many. And so uh, 
Uh, we'll be uh, adjourning the uh, meeting today uh, in memory of uh, two folks, uh, including uh, Mr. Mo Baganu. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. I want to echo those uh, sentiments. Um, I think all of us that knew Mo knew just what kind of a genuine, good-hearted person he was. And as you know, you and I share, um, uh, well, I want to say we share the Roosevelt uh, camp as being a proud alum. I know you represent him, but I, I'm very close. And he was a big volunteer for the um, bass uh, fishing club for the kids there. And, you know, I, I think he did it very quietly, um, but that was just his nature, very giving, good-hearted person, and we want to express our condolences to, to the family um, as well. Um, I, I just have a couple quick points. Uh, Mayor, City Manager, I just want to thank your team uh, for the work you guys did during this heat wave and opening up those cooling centers, the splash parks, the pools. I can't tell you just what great feedback we got from residents. Um, I had a chance to go out there and, and see everything just, you know, going, and I think that was very much appreciated by the community. So I just want to thank our, our public um, uh, folks for uh, doing the work. I know it wasn't easy. I do have just one um, small question because I got this uh, request. Do we, allow, um, do we allow pets to actually enter the facility, or is that not yes. allowed? I'm looking over here at my mayor, and he's saying, yes, we do. Yeah. Why not? Okay. All right, <laughs> good. Then, then I can, then I can, and it was it was a deterrent for some of our homeless folks that didn't want to leave their pets outside. So, so now it's on the record. The, the mayor said it's okay to bring your pets and uh, your your cats, dogs, parrots, or whatever you 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 have with you. Um, we should probably come up with some guidelines, mayor, on what that would look like, right, with a leash and all that stuff, just to avoid problems. George, George Ann just gave me the evil eye, but yeah, we'll we'll take the pets. <laughs> Pets, pets or, deserve or to be cooled off too. Yes, 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 they do. Uh, so, so thank you for that, uh, uh, Mayor. And then just briefly, um, I know I, we've been getting a lot of calls. Myself, my colleagues, uh, Mayor, you too, you as well, from our residents with regards to the Fourth of July uh, fires that we have. Um, I'm I'm working along with Councilmember Arias on an ordinance. I think it'll uh, mitigate some of the, those effects, and we're going to be working with. Uh, the administration on, on see if we can come up with a, a long-term solution. I know that it was a huge problem. And, uh, you know, they say that lightning never strikes twice, but the same, the same individual that lit that palm on fire uh, next to my house somehow managed to light the second palm on fire. Um, and I know our folks went out there and he got a nice ticket, but um, there's got to be a better way of us being a little bit more, you know, preventative and, and hopefully having that uh, next year for that. So I just want to flag that for the administration. And so with that, I will conclude my comments. Uh, Mayor, city manager, do you guys have any, any reports? Yeah, thank you, Council President. Just a couple on my end. Um, project off-ramp uh, this past week, we were finally able to get to the uh, 99 freeway and um, very uh, encouraged by the efforts this last week uh, with the Pavarello House, the Mission, uh, Caltrans, CHP, uh, able to relocate in three days uh, 105 people who were on the 99 freeway into housing. And so that brings our, our grand total since we started Project Off-Ramp to 423 homeless people who have been housed and uh, well over 500 who have been relocated from the freeways. Uh, and uh, there is still going to be uh, work done this week, uh, removing some of the items and the property, uh, working with Caltrans and our sanitation crews. Um, but uh, now we can uh, begin uh, very shortly. Once we get some more uh, motels refurbished, we can get uh, we can start uh, neighborhood by neighborhood. And I look forward uh, to doing that very quickly as well, uh, as well as uh, uh, Camp Des. Uh, getting those folks uh, in, into housing, which is going to be one of our, uh, our priorities. So a uh, second thing is uh, we launched uh, another Camp Fresno this week, actually two of them. Uh, day, uh, we had a day camp with some youth, and then we had uh, the three-day camp. And so in total, we've, hit, we've sent 186 kids uh, from our community uh, to Camp Fresno. And we have 11 more camps that will be uh, remaining this summer and I can tell you the feedback from these kids has been incredible. 77% um, of the ones that have been surveyed said that uh, Camp Fresno has helped their mental uh, well-being. And 99% uh, of them said they'd made new friends at camp, and that's what it's all about. And so uh, very thankful and appreciative of the support of the council, not only on our 
Camp Fresno, but uh, Project Off Ramp as well as our uh, Beautify Fresno event. So, and uh, we'll look forward to working with you, uh, Council President, on the Fourth uh, of July response. I met with my staff this last week, uh, talking about some ideas that we can uh, move forward on, as well as the City Attorney's Office, uh, not only on the fine uh, increase in the fine, but also on the enforcement efforts next year. So, that's it. Okay, thank you, uh, City Manager. Yes, quickly, uh, again, I want to thank Council for getting working together through the budget. It's pretty awesome, pretty historic. Um, but I did want to steal some words from Council Member Arias that he just used just now. Be patient. So based on the budget you guys have approved, thank you very much, um, we've got about 150 vehicles to purchase to get the program going, and vehicles of all sorts are difficult to get right now. So our fleet guys are trying to pull out every trick in the book to get the vehicles filled for those approvals that you guys gave us. Um, we're going to be adding 200 new bodies to the, to the city staff. Overall, filling the vacancies and everything else, we're probably looking at hiring 500 people this next year. So we're working with our personnel department to get them staffed up, pull resources from all the other departments, and, and get moving on mobiliz mobilizing so that we can get that done. But there will be a process of ramping up to get the equipment and the people and supplies in place. I'm trying to schedule meetings with each of you the next couple of weeks just to check in with you guys on just here's our implementation plan for all the elements you guys approved in the budget and just kind of keep you posted. I'd like to do that now, and then we'll do it again probably November, December, see how the mid-year numbers come in and just see you know if we need to make any adjustments, how we might do that. But uh, look forward to meeting with you guys on how we're moving forward to getting everything done. And then got a lot of bodies to hire, a lot of vehicles to purchase, and we just ask that you give us that time to get that stuff done. So I appreciate you uh, approving the budget as you did, and we'll go forward and get it done. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. All right, let's move on to consent and unscheduled communication. We got a lot of folks here that want to speak today. I want to make sure we get to them. Um, quite a bit of, of cards, so I'm going to take public comment on consent items, unscheduled, and closed session. Um, and so with that, let's start off with Ms. Uh, Cynthia Sterling. You'll have two minutes, ma'am. Welcome, welcome back to the spaceship, so to speak. It looks entirely different, <laughs> and it's very different from this perspective. Good morning, Mr. Council President, to the mayor, to um, all of you today. I'm here, it really grieves my heart to be here today. Um, I'm here today to speak on uh, former clerk, Yvonne Spence. As a former councilwoman, I sat on the dais uh, for eight years. As a former planning commissioner, I was in, the, in and out of the council chambers for another 13 years. At, in no time during those time periods did we ever have a situation where someone was fired with no information given, no reasoning, just taken from their seat just because. And I had to stop and think about that because there were a number of times that under our purview with the city clerk, uh, the uh, city attorney, others, we had some issues, we had concerns, and we did bring that concern uh, to them. We would sit, we would have conversation, we would discuss, and then we would come to some kind of resolve. My understanding as a former member of the Fresno City Council in this particular case that the lack of consideration, the rudeness, and the disrespect that uh, former city clerk Spence has been shown has just been beyond anything that any of us could even imagine. And I guess it doesn't really, and it, it grieves my heart to wonder, what were you all thinking and why did you do it this way? We understand that it's, it's, it's private business, that you can't bring it to our attention. You can't talk about what the, the reasonings are, but everybody has their day in court. She should have had a chance to sit with you and to have some type of opportunity to find out what in the world am I being charged with. With that being said, in my other hat, I am president of Black Women Organized for Political Action, the Fresno San Joaquin Valley chapter. I want you to realize that in that role, we do have a number of uh, people in our organization that are politically savvy, that have legal 
understanding and that, in fact, we have great reach throughout the entire United States as we are, uh, one of our life members is uh, United States President, Vice President Kamala Harris. That this information, that this situation here today, it has been brought to our attention and that we are going to be looking into it. And we are going to follow the legal process in order and rightly so to find out what was the actual reasoning for this? What was so egregious that you just automatically just fire someone with no information given to them? When I was on the city council, I had made a number of mistakes, especially in my first year. I happened to uh, purchase tickets for an event, thinking it was the right thing to do, come to find out it did not meet with FPPC requirements and I had to pay it back. Thank goodness that in many cases that my former chief of staff, now the assistant city manager, Mr. Greg Barfield, came to my rescue uh, because of his uh, advanced experience in politics to make sure that I stayed on the right and always stayed in uh, accordance to where I was supposed to be. But today it seems like there's no kind of understanding, there seems to be no kind of assistance or bringing us into you know, whatever it is that we need to do to make sure that a person's role is, is correct. I hope that we have noticed that Ms. Spence came qualified, she was highly educated, and that she, was rec she took the city from where our former city clerk, Be Becky Klisch, was to a new level that she brought it into the 21st century with technology, and she was a great assistance in that area. That she may have had some issues, but I do hope that you will take that under consideration when you do have to come before the legal system in addressing that her qualifications were there. And I do hope that the person that you have replaced her with is as qualified as she is and that you have the same type of commitment and dedication that she gave to the city for the number of years that she was here. Like I said, please be on notice that black women organize for political action. The Fresno chapter, San Joaquin Valley chapter, is paying attention that we will be following this case and that we are working, hopefully, in tandem with the situation. To uh, Council Member Kabasi, please give my regards to your father. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sterling. Next up is Ms. Sabrina Kelly, followed by Ms. Debbie Darden. Let me just give Ryan a quick minute to sanitize. Thank, thank you for that, Ryan. Good morning, Council President and City Council members. I stand before you today as part of the membership of the Fresno Collective of Black Leaders. And I too am very grieved about the decisions and the actions that were made by this city council. As a collective of black leaders and citizens, we are not confident that our elected officials are acting in our best interest as a group. Our grievance is in response to the consistent actions and decisions of the city council members and internal city leaders that support systemic and structural racial inequities that have disproportionately resulted in the clandestine removal of black leaders who were once employed for the city of Fresno, namely Crystal Smith from Housing, Parvin Nellums from Parks, Brian Marshall from Transportation, and now the termination of Yvonne Spence is a tipping point. The tipping point that reveals a deeper issue of structural racism and misuse of power at the city of Fresno. Your actions as elected officials and city leaders are guideposts and data. Data that points to crucial racial inequities. Data that points to behind the door collaborations and conversations that do not benefit all Fresnans. When we look at the data for black people in Fresno, we can see visually, as you drive throughout the city and county of Fresno, where do you see black people working anywhere? 
in grocery stores, in fast food restaurants, in retail chains. For a population of 8%, we have a double digit unemployment rate. That is unacceptable. And that is part of your work as city leaders to advocate for opportunities and justice for all. Your commitment is on display here. The data tells a story and a narrative about a lack of commitment to true diversity and inclusion and supporting a zero sum net that says there must be winners or losers based on population demographic numbers, based on the fact that, it, that black people are 8% of the population and others have a greater percentage. Does that mean we're not, we don't have access to the equality and the opportunity that our foremothers and forefathers were arrested, bled, and died for? How do we then move forward to support justice and equity and inclusion for all? Our demands are simple. Number one, we want an anti-racism task force to look at how we might come together as a community to address structural racism, implicit bias, and forge a path together as a, as a community. We are asking you and we are inviting you to be thought partners with us. We're inviting you to have an open mind to review your individual actions and your collective decisions. Reflect on the information that we are sharing. Not just listen to us today, but hear us today. And reflect on your role in, in the structural racism and more importantly, the broader anti-black racism that is, has a grip hold on our city. Look at it from our perspective. Drive through the city and look through our lens. If it were one of you and your ethnic group was disappearing from leadership, non-existent in employment opportunities in places where you shop and you frequent, non-existent on a dais where you pay your taxes, how would that make you feel as a resident? How does your actions and your decisions translate into history? What is your legacy going to be? as Fresno City Council, we invite you to be thought partners, to be change agents with us. And as Dr. King often said, it is always the right time to do the right thing. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Debbie Darden, followed by Pastor B.T. Lewis. Good morning, City Council leaders. My name is Debbie Darden. I am the chair for the Golden West Light Planning Committee, also one of the members of the Black Coalition of Black Leaders. I'm here to say, African Americans are still in the heart of fighting from slavery to now. We fought for equity for everybody, but we don't receive the same reciprocity. A clear example is the release of the Fresno City clerk and African American female one who was dedicated to serving the city of Fresno for the last nine years. In the last six years, three top Amer African American leaders within upper management have been dismissed by the city of Fresno for no justifiable reason. Mr. Brian Marshall, 2014 to 2017, arrived here with 20 years of experience. Mr. Parvin Nellums arrived here 2017 to 2019, director of parks with over 18 years of experience. And Mrs. Javon Spence, 2012 to 2021, with over 20 years of experience. And with no true justification for your calls for dismissal, the city of Fresno hides behind its own at will clause. This is a clear message sent to us by the city of Fresno that the Jim Crow laws are in fact still being practiced today. We leave you with one question, those of you who participated in the dismissal. Do black lives really matter to you? I hope that resonates with you every single day when you take a look in the mirror. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Darden. Next up is Pastor B.T. Lewis, followed by Pastor D.J. Kreiner. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 
yet. I, just hope my, I hope the that, time haven't started yet. Thank you. No, no, don't worry about that. All right. Good morning, Council. Uh, again, my name is Pastor B.T. Lewis, Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church, Chairman of the African American Clergy Caucus, all that kind of stuff. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, uh, and I truly mean this, that this council is producing great work in our city. And I want you to know that we believe that. And I want to uh, especially thank our, my councilman in District 3. He is doing great work in our community. Uh, but let me, um, let me say that uh, this issue, this issue, we have two issues that we are working with here in our community in this collective. Uh, the, uh, one of them is the fact that there is a, a black leadership erosion in our community, in our county, and we are addressing that. Uh, but today we are addressing the unjust um, and cruel dismissal of Yvonne Spence uh, from her city clerk uh, position. The wrongful termination of Ms. Spence uh, from this position must have been the result of, uh, of some a form of misunderstanding or misinformation. Uh, the first indicator that this was a decision, uh, uh, that this decision was not made uh, through objective, uh, documented assessment of her performance is that, uh, is that three level-headed honorable councilmen voted against this proposal, a hardly an overwhelming majority. Uh, th this further indicates uh, that affirmative votes for her dismissal were driven by subjective personal opinions and agendas rather than tangible documented facts. Uh, consider the irony, uh, and I wish uh, Councilman Bredefield was here, but consider the irony of Councilman Bredefield voting uh, in concert with Councilman Arias. Uh, uh, that is very interesting. Uh, uh, and I wanted to let Councilman Bredefield know, I wish he was here today, that grudges die hard. It was a misappropriation of power, cruel and unprofessional to engage in a process of dismissal without at least some form, a formal period of uh, notice and opportunity to correct any uh, suggestions of incompetence. It is cruel and inhumane to dismiss anyone uh, while on leave and notice them by phone. And, and, and why would you reward an employee with a pay increase in March and dismiss her without sufficient cause in July? Uh, in, the, in the majority, uh, if the majority of this council had issues with Ms. Spence's performance, uh, why increase her, uh, her salary by nearly $25,000 and then three months later uh, dismiss her unceremoniously? Uh, to reward a poorly performing employee uh, as a result of a comparative study simply does not make sense. If elected officials are dissatisfied, were dissatisfied with Ms. Spencer's performance, uh, you would think that they would have documented her, uh, their dissatisfaction and walked her through a legitimate process of get well uh, uh, and then dismissal. Uh, our sources indicate that this is not what transpired in regard to Measure P, the Measure P fiasco. Uh, it, was our, it is our understanding that our city clerk, uh, 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 Yvonne Spence, took responsibility for the uh, wrong language on the ballot measure because it was produced out of her office, a mistake that uh, my sources tell me should have been attributed to our current city clerk, uh, Brianna Parra. Ms. Parra still has her job, a promotion, and the potential of a position upgrade, an option that eluded Mrs. Spence for over nine years. And it isn't true, I'm sorry, and isn't it true, I'm sorry, that even our city attorney's office also played a role in the Measure P fiasco, given, his, uh, given their questionable uh, legal interpretation that was rejected by the Court of Appeals, and after costing the city a fortune in legal fees, yet they still have their jobs. I am not implying that they should be fired or dismissed. In, uh, in my business, we do not return evil for evil. Nevertheless, it does seem odd that the person who gets fired uh, for, uh, for reasons we still don't really know is black and, begs the and it begs the question as to how much Ms. Spence's race 
uh, his, uh, implicitly, uh, if not deliberately, played a role in her dismissal. Fresno's history of racial inequality that still exists today, it still exists today. However, we never associated, uh, we, we, we never, skip, we simply expressed our disappointment uh, in the methodology of this council. And, apparent, uh, and apparently three of our councilmen uh, were also dissatisfied with the actions uh, of their colleagues. We would rather not wait until the tire is completely flat before sounding the alarm that there is a severe leak, severe leak in our systems. Uh, Dr. King said, it is not possible to be in favor of justice for some people and not be in favor of justice for all people. Uh, we had uh, four demands. Uh, 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 Ms. Kelly I highlighted one of them. That is the creation uh, uh, of a uh, task force uh, that will receive and review hiring and dismissal policies um, and procedures of our city. Uh, we also demand a third party audit of the city hiring and dis dismissal practices over the past 20 years uh, that will highlight demographical injustice and trends incongruent with truth and equity for everyone. We demand that our esteemed council uh, accept responsibility for the ridiculous action of dismissal against Ms. Spence and then consider remuneration uh, deserved by one who has rendered 12 years of documented extraordinary service and, uh, uh, and appropriate uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and a, a response that is appropriate to address the mean-spirited harm done her, her family, and her reputation. And then finally, we demand that the city of Fresno create a strategy for em uh, employee evaluation, discipline, uh, credential uh, consideration, and credential consideration that will encourage the hiring of quality candidates and negate practices of racism, nepotism, and rampant favoritism uh, too common in this building. Many times our quest for truth uh, and justice is uncomfortable and it is inconvenient, but it is necessary. We are not demanding favor, but we are demanding fairness. God bless you and thank you for your time. Next up is Pastor DJ Kreiner. Just give Ryan a couple of quick seconds to sanitize. Let me follow up by Mr. Eric Payne um, after Pastor DJ Kreiner. We, uh, first of all, to our, our council president and to all who are sitting up at our diocese, we, uh, we honor you for your service and also for the work that you have done, as uh, Pastor Lewis just stated. But Pastor Lewis really has said um, everything. Um, uh, Sister um, Sabrina Kelly has said um, all of the talking points, really, in our, in our pain. And uh, Sister Debbie has really highlighted not just the pain of those that you all see, uh, sitting before you, but also the community of individuals that are unable either to get off work um, or are at home with their children or watching us live. Um, so I'll just kind of give a touching point to how deeply rooted uh, this pain is. Um, this morning I got up to head to our council and my oldest daughter who turns 10 on Monday stopped me. And my oldest child asked, Dad, where are you going? And I told her I'm going to city council. I said, why? And Georgian, I told her, well, I'm speaking on behalf of Yvonne Spence. And in our community, everybody is either auntie or uncle uh, because we're taught as children never to call an older individual by their first name. It's called putting a handle on that. So it's always auntie or uncle. And so she said, what happened to Auntie Yvonne? And I said, well, she was dismissed. She was fired. And she said, who do I look up to when I come to city council now? That hurt me. It hurt me deeply. And though we do have a sister that we recognize to my left, and though we do have a brother that is kissed by heaven's rays and has melanin in him, there is a sister that was always here for nine years plus. My daughter is nine years old. Last evening, it made sense, and I'll sit down. Last evening, we sat down to have dinner after Bible study. 
and there's two tables in our home. There's a table right outside of the kitchen and then the dining area. My wife and I sit in the dining area. That's where the adults sit. The kids sit at the kids' table. After dinner was over, the kids were putting the dishes up. The kids were cleaning up the food. While we're sat in the living room getting ready to do final prayer, Faith, that nine-year-old kid, walked up to me, brother, and she said, Daddy, when can we sit at the table? I said, when you grow up. She said, so we can clean the table, and we can clean the dishes, but we can't sit at the table. No one that is of her age that she sees can sit at the table. I say to you, my friends, you can call on us to clean up mess. You can call on us to fix problems before it reaches the diocese. But for some reason now, I don't see us represented at the table. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mr. Eric Payne. Just give Brian, Brian a couple of minutes, uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Um, it's really tough to come after DJ Kreiner because I think he really encapsulated um, much of the sentiments that African American leaders are feeling. Um, I know each of you intimately well um, across the dais, and I know that I can pick up the phone and call you anytime, and I know that you can pick up the phone and call me anytime. Um, I have a deep amount of respect for your leadership, for the bravery that you've exhibited over the, the last eight years of public service that you've been in office. Um, and I know that um, this is, I'm supposed to be up here talking about the urban water management plan, um, but relative to um, the removal of Ms. Spence, um, it's alarming and it's concerning. And I know that, um, this, this is only the beginning of a conversation. I would hope that this is not the end of a conversation. Um, I've had, um, I believe that um, when my family moved here from the South um, in the 50s, um, that they were fleeing an institution of racism in the Jim Crow South. Um, and I, I would like to recognize that I don't believe that the folks that are sitting at this table represent any of that, um, that they are here to dismantle that. Um, and I hope that we can continue to move forward and have these courageous conversations about racial reconciliation, about access to equity and opportunity in our community for all people. Um, and we need to be starting from the bottom. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Next up will be Ms. Carla Martinez, and she wants to speak on the local housing trust fund. Do we have Ms. Martinez? Just a quick second while Mr. Ryan takes care of that. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, good morning, council members, mayor, and staff. My name is Carla Martinez, and I'm a policy advocate with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, we are glad to see the city take the first step in alleviating the housing crisis in Fresno by formally establishing a local housing trust fund. This will allow for millions of dollars. Excuse to me, Carla. Yeah. Can you, you put that lower the, mic? the microphone okay. just a little bit? I'm short. So there, there you go. Is that better? That, yeah. that works. Thank okay. you. This will allow for millions of dollars to go into alleviating the housing crisis in Fresno, and the city will now be in compliance with Program 5 and the housing element. However, the current projects being proposed for the local housing trust funds lack the initiative to make significant strides in addressing the housing shortage and leaves existing units behind. During the workshop hosted by the city planning division, many housing advocates voiced projects and programs that include weatherization, preservation of existing housing, prevention programs such as housing rights education for tenants and landlords, and the opportunity to comply with many more housing elements that the city is obligated to legally comply with. We understand that the city is trying to maximize the amount of points they receive, but that must not divert the objective of this trust fund, which is to prevent residents from becoming homeless. We ask the city to expand the local housing trust fund programs and include the following programs. One, housing rehabilitation programs. There should be funds available to tenants and homeowners who are interested in rehabilitating their homes and also focus on energy efficient homeowner assistance programs. This includes loan, loans or grants for Sorry, efficiency and climate sustainability, such as weatherization and energy retrofit programs. 
Second, first time homeowner assistance programs. This includes low interest loans or grants for mortgage assistance programs such as down payment assistance. Third, acquisition. This includes purchasing vacant or abandoned buildings and homes, transferring ownership to a citywide land trust fund to promote community ownership and fend off corporate speculators. Fourth, housing rights education. Programs that include community outreach and education on tenants' rights, investigation of rights violations, and landlord responsibilities. Fifth, tenant assistance and temporary housing. The housing trust fund program should focus on long-term solutions, not temporary relief. Even so, the fund should include some protected resources for emergency circumstances, which may require financial assistance or temporary housing tenants. These programs include rental assistance or temporary relocation. Six, community, <coughs> community coordination. The local housing trust fund must be community-led and priorities identified by residents. Tenants should have the decision-making authority and oversight on all activities and programs related to the trust fund. We hope to continue working with the city and see these programs implemented in order to alleviate the housing crisis and keep Fresno residents safe and housed. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Robert McCloskey. Mr. McCloskey, still in the audience? Just give Ryan a quick minute while he sanitizes. Good morning. Thank you, council members. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying, let's stop stereotyping those that are unhoused. There are many, many reasons why people wind up on the streets, as we know. At almost every press conference we see, they get stereotyped. And certainly, it has no value in trying to bring resolution to this crisis. I, I'll start out with the grand jury report. First of all, they made some critiques of the current efforts on housing. First saying the street to home uh, jobs should be filled. The street to home, which is a housing first approach, first talked about in 2008, ha has yet to be implemented. The other was the lack of coordination between the city and the county. As we know, that's still very true, we can all admit. Uh, the other one was reporting and transparency. I think there's some issues there. There are a number of reports due to the state and the federal government that the public should have knowledge of and to see exactly where all this funding is going. And another critique was not including the voice of the community in particular, those that are unhoused, which is still not happening. Uh, and, and we can talk about racial inequality. Go out on the streets of Fresno, you see it. With the poor and the unhoused being disproportionately brown and black people out there on the streets. Uh, recently, Fresno County cleaned up a homeless encampment along Kings County Avenue, just east of Temperance. Those people were removed there by project off-ramp. And once again, they were being displaced with nowhere to go. The county must, the city and county must implement a moratorium on enforcement of any laws that criminalize the unhoused, Consider immediate opening of public buildings, vacant at night as emergency shelter. Uh, immediate opening of more cooling centers, thank you for that, without restrictions on pets, that's great. Public disclosure of vacant city-owned, city-controlled, and tax delinquent properties and their designation as available emergency housing. Full compliance with the legal requirements of Martin versus Boise, the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that prohibits enactment and enforcement of laws targeting the homeless where no alternative indoor shelter has been provided. And every time there's a workshop, a press conference, or anything, everyone's admitting on a daily basis there are no shelter beds. We all know that. So why are people going around, Pavarello House people and mayor like, we're going to solve this within three or four years. No, immediately we should acknowledge the legitimacy of homes on wheels, 
parking in industrial zones and other parking lots throughout the city, and all these safe camps with sanitary facilities and trash services, providing showers. And what happened to the promise in April to roll out showers and restrooms in July? I don't see that. I, it, it isn't happening. That is very necessary. Work with this county to approve safe camps as a necessary, temporary, and humane measure. Let's consider tiny home villages, trailer villages. Let's consider that we've only maybe housed 10% of those that are in need of housing. Let's look at what Sacramento study that in this heat wave, they did measurements inside tents with temperatures reaching up to 135 degrees inside a tent on these hot days. It's untenable. I urge any one of you to join us going out there with Project H2O and hand out cold water on these very hot days. You meet a lot of good people, a lot of different people out there for a lot of good, different reasons, a lot of economic reasons and such. So please, let's try to address this matter in a civilized way and approve safe camps. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Robert Morsey. Uh, Mr. Robert Morsey, you just give our friend Ryan a quick minute. Go ahead, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Am I speaking up close enough with this um, silly mask on? Um, I want to, I, on behalf of myself, I want to say, oh, he's not here. Shame on you, Mayor Dyer, and shame on all of you city council members who voted to put the, to fly the rainbow flag at city council, or at the, at the outside the chambers here. Um, the people that have, have usurped that flag are, are sick, pe sick people, and there's nothing to be proud about for the, kind, the perverse actions, the inhumane actions they perform. Um, the beautiful rainbow was given to blessed Noah after he was... But Des, the, please, please be respectful. Please be respectful. This man has a right to say what he wants to say, whether you disagree with it or not. Let's allow him to speak and then move on. Please. Um, he spent a year in that ark before he finally, it finally came to ground. And God, God gave us all that rainbow. It doesn't belong to anyone for any perverse cause. Now they can, the, the LGBTQ XYZ can always go to their creator and ask for help. And he's listening every step of the way. He knows when we're sincere and when we're not, he doesn't give us help. Sodom and Gomorrah were, you know, pretty badly, very bad. It couldn't be any worse, the punishment they got. And the word Sodom, sodomy, is related to Sodom, sodomy. The word, I don't think I got that right, but um, sodomy is what this community is, is part of. Uh, is partnering with and that's, that's not anything that we should be flying in front of City Hall just that I'm sure that there was some kind of flag in Sodom and Gomorrah too that um, 
or you wouldn't have liked here. You could wrap up your comments, Mr. Morsi. Yes, uh, President Chavez. I think I've said enough. I don't, uh, for Thank some you. For some people, I'm sure I've said too much, and I don't mean to offend anyone, and would be glad to speak with them anytime. You had your opportunity. Thank you. Uh, next up will be uh, Ms. Brandy Nuz Villegas. Let's give our friend a couple of minutes to uh, a couple of seconds. Just towards us. Brent. Ms. Brandy, you wanted to speak on the homeless issue, I believe is the, the, the title that you put on here. Go ahead, the last part of the council. Uh, I just wanted to have, could the council come back? Should I start or wait for them? Just give us a quick second. Yeah, no problem. There they come. All right, they're back. Go ahead, go ahead, Ms. Ms. Uh, Villegas. Okay, thank you. Um, Brandy Ms. Villegas, first of all, thank you for flying the pride flag and on behalf of me and everyone that um, in our community. Um, I wanna thank you for the vaccination events uh, thank you for the pets, allowing pets in shelters. Um, I want to absolutely stand with Yvonne and the people standing with her today and demanding justice for our community. I ask that you listen to her demands. Um, it's been an exhausting week for a lot of us, getting water to those who are most vulnerable throughout the city who are unsheltered and being in the presence of people who want help and shelters and have no options. I want to continue that you ask and demand that motel shelters be available to all who want them. Um, I ask that you demand that the homeless task force sweeps and displacements stop. Um, Dyer said on July, January 27th that these are ineffective and that there's better ways. So why are displacements still happening? We know of them uh, when it is hot. I ask that you, this includes people on the, the highways. I am grateful for those who have gotten shelter this week. I actually gave water to some of them, but there are people who were left behind that weren't included for various reasons. And I know that does help advocate and get them in shelters. And Cindy went to bat for someone who was, should have been on the list. And when they went and looked, they, they realized that they, they did, he should have been included. But there are people who are left behind and should not be out in the heat and I ask for contingencies for those people who are remaining um, in, in, in the, because this does happen. Uh, I spoke to two people who didn't accept motels because they didn't feel safe on Parkway, so I ask that we continue to seek out shelters in other places, and I continue to ask that you direct the homeless office to document why people might not be able to be put into services or might not accept services, and the reason why it would help possibly help overcome challenges and get them into shelters, but also give you um, a client-centered way to move forward and um, to be able to give a reason for spending more money in shelters and other districts. And I ask that you listen to those who are, to our homeless are speaking um, after me. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Des Martinez. <laughs> Ms. Martinez. Ms. Martinez, you'll have three minutes. Hello and thank you. Oh. Hello and thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, my head's somewhere else because I've never, I haven't experienced something like what this gentleman said. I fought 20 years on the hate on my son. Even here in Fresno, California, my son had to leave here because of the hate crime because he is non-binary. So sorry to sit up here and see another human being. Damn my son for what he chose in his life. It hurts me. And that's not what I came up here to talk about, but I want you to know it hurts me. And I'm a human being just like you. And your words did hurt me today. So I'm sorry. I would like the city to consider designating campgrounds in every district where people can live without fear of being rousted out by authorities 
Such campgrounds, sometimes called safe grounds, already exist and are being considered in other cities, including Sacramento, our capital. They can typically accommodate tents, cars, RVs, or even tiny homes on wheels. Unlike safe parking programs, residents can stay all day. Some sites are inappropriate for encampments, such as highways, schools, canals, railroad tracks, including areas where fire danger is high and where creeks and canals can be polluted. Would it really be so hard to designate places where basic services are, including clean water, toilets, showers, and shade can be provided? Agencies can offer medical aid, counseling, and other supportive services while waiting for a shelter bed or permanent housing. I am asking our city leaders to develop a communications and engagement strategy that would increase awareness on a local homelessness and related challenges as well as services and immediate resources that are available at that time. I would like our city council and mayor to look into the city, the San Diego storage warehouse also. Storage Connect Center is a facility that houses 500 storage containers and serves homeless individuals who are 18 years or older in the city of San Diego. The Storage Connect Center provides a service protected space for participants in the city of San Diego to store their personal belongings and ongoing basis to have access to their belongings during the hours of operation seven days a week. Each participant in the facility will have access to one lockable storage container free of charge. Facility staff will provide participants with access to their belongings in a waiting area under supervision. The homeless outreach workers, which is MHS in San Diego, engages with participants and link them to housing, employment, and other services. I would like to finish off with something, and this is no insult to anybody. The heart team, I have seen the new heart team, and I am sorry, but the only difference between homeless task force and the heart team is a polo shirt. I feel we need these officers back on the street for the whole community and not babysitting sanitation workers. We have been told numerous times by some city council members, our ex-chief and now mayor, that we need to hire more cops. So why not put those officers back in the community and dressing crime and we can use the money given to FPD for the heart team to build more affordable housing, drug treatment facilities, mental health living facilities, or parks and programs for the youth. A police officer serves to maintain the law and order in local areas by protecting members of the public and their property, preventing crime, reducing the fear of crime, and improving the quality of life for all citizens. Homelessness is not a crime. That's it. Thank you. Next up is uh, Ms. Shelley, and she also wanted to speak on the homeless issue. Uh, we are not invisible, so Shelley. Is Shelley still here? Okay. Council President, if I may, while Shelly comes up, City Manager, I know we have a item related to homelessness on the contested consent. Just want to give you a heads up that we should be prepared to get an update on the heart team. We are we still don't know what the design of the team is, who's doing what, where, how. So we can just be prepared to brief the council so the public can also understand what the heart team is doing and who they are. Thank you for that, Miss Shelly. Yes. Go ahead. Hi again. My name is Kelly Forrest, and I'm homeless. And it's really hard out there. I don't really know what to say. <laughs> Mr. President. Thank you. Yes. Well, never mind. Thank you. Yes. All right, next up is uh, Flower. Uh, just put Flower, and she's also with We Are Not Invisible um, organization. And, and it'll be follow up by Ms. Cheyenne, uh, will be next after uh, Ms. Flower, just so you could get ready. Hi, my name is Flower. I've been homeless for two years. As the, being at the safe camp is wonderful. It's, it's more safer than being on the streets because you don't know when, you know, you, we live in tents. We work together as a family. We're always, you know, trying to keep our, each other's stuff, you know, from no one taking it. We're always looking out for each other. But being on, on the other side of the gates, I can't sleep. 
I can't sleep on the outside of the safe camp if I'm out there because, you know, we have to watch our steps. So me, me and my husband have to take turns. One night he sleeps and one night I sleep. And we're always taking turns. Being in the safe camp, all we need is water. Water and electricity is all we ask for there. You know, I, I do need um, permanent housing or affordable housing because I haven't seen my grandchildren in two years. I got 18 grandchildren and I have not seen them. And my daughter right now, she is, she is um, gay, she is a lesbian and she's pregnant out there and I'm trying to get her to stay where she's at because Des Martinez helped her get there and I appreciate her very, very much, you know? Um, we just need more safe camps around because like I said, it's wonderful being there. You know, you meet a lot of people where you get to be friends and family. Um, we don't have very many things to do there, but hey, we, we try to keep our, our P's and Q's, you know, as best as we can. Whatever we try to do is cleaning, you know, to show that, hey, this is our house too. We can clean it up and we try to keep it clean, you know. Um, but like I said, if we can get affordable housing, I would love to see my grandchildren. I would really love to see my grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Next up is Ms. Uh, Cheyenne, uh, followed by Ernie. Uh, also with um, We Are Not Invisible, right after uh, Michelle. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, my name is Cheyenne. I am only 17 years old. For the last year, I have lived on the east side of Fresno. I came from a background of living in Clovis, which should give you the idea that I, well, my father had money. I always had nice clothes, nice shoes, and luxury things I, have, I wanted, such as Dutch Bros or nice Nike shoes. Things happened and I was reunited with my mother. Since then, for the last year, I am always on the road with my mother as she does her advocate work with our street family members and have seen the good and bad. No matter where I go though, whether it's the safe camp, which my mother runs, and as you guys know her, Des Martinez, the wonderful woman who does it all. <laughs> um, and the neighborhood that I live in, which is District 5, I'm in dangerous areas. I live in a low-income area where there is violence, such as shootings every night, hearing screams from my back window, and the amount of drugs that is just across the street in a park. I go to the safe camp, which is around the Pavarello area, and there are also shootings and fights that occur very often. Now you may ask or think, well, why are you in these areas? Well, here is your answer. Because my mother is on a low income with disability, she has no choice but to live in a low income area, which is where a lot of violence occurs, and I have no other family but my mother. I have seen guns pointed, which actually caused me trauma not to be in certain areas. When I lived in Clovis, I never saw the amount of violence and danger Fresno has until this last year. I have had three people shot, stabbed, and killed in front of my patio, and it is not something I would ever wanted to endure. When all those teens were dying, I was so afraid that I would be the next one. My mindset had changed and it was, if I die today, then I die. That's the world it has become. Do you think that this is a good mindset for a teen as young as me or younger to think this way? Fresno has done that to me and District 5, the way it is, has done that to me. Do you guys not understand that we are your future? The teens who have been killed were your guys' future. I am your future, and if I have to get into the politics and the city council stuff to make you guys hear me, then I will gladly to change my major in college and do it. Have you heard that Fresno, the saying that Fresno is the devil's playground? I believe it's true. Why don't we look like Clovis? Why don't we have what they have? Why are we left to be stuck behind while they are on top? Fresno should not look any different from Clovis. I am only 17 years old, and if you have somebody as young as me or younger in here telling you what they have gone through and what needs to be done, there is something you guys need to open your eyes to and really listen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is uh, Ernie. Ernie with also uh, we, are, we Are Not Invisible. Brian, a quick minute to sanitize. 
Go ahead, sir. The floor is yours. How are you guys doing, gentlemen? Hey, my name's Ernie. I've been homeless. You could speak a little bit closer to the mic, please. I've been homeless for about two, two years. Me and my wife, I mean, like she said, we've never seen our grandkids for a while because I don't want to bring them out here to this area. I mean, well, I'm used to seeing my grandkids all the time. But, there we go. but I can't see them no more because yeah, yeah, no. But I just wish you guys just put put an affordable house out there for me, for for us. I mean, we're like one big old family out there. I mean, I never met individuals, people out there that I consider as my family, as I do now. I mean, I wouldn't change nothing of it, and I'm glad Des Martinez is here in my life because she is a big part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Mr. Lance Cruz, also with uh, We Are Not Invisible. Good morning. Uh, I want to echo Randy's gratitude for the things that you guys have been working on and doing. Um, I've just recently become started uh, working with We Are Not Invisible a little bit. Um, they let me into their camp. They didn't judge me um, and allowed me to uh, go pick up some food from them out for them out in Clovis. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of food uh, that was free. They, they had to give almost all of it away in their outreach program, the people in the camp doing the outreach program to the people that aren't able to be in a camp. Um, and I watched a meeting a few weeks ago, and it seemed... Ooh, you all right? Uh, it, it, it seemed like you guys were talking about a tremendous amount of money. I think it came from, I think it came from the CARES Act or, uh, uh, maybe two meetings ago. And I would think the number we were spending on the police was something like $92 million. I, I don't remember the number. They were very big numbers, right? $100 million type numbers. Um, and when I go to the camp, I don't know if you guys have been there. Um, when I go to the camp, I see something that's running on nothing, right? It's nothing. It's, it's a dirt patch. They're stoked to have the freeway, right, providing some shade. Um, there's, they got car batteries in there for energy. They got, I mean, they're just really making it work on nothing. They're supporting each other, building a little, put a little tarp around a thing to, 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 to put an air conditioner in there to try and keep people's body temperature, you know, under 100 degrees. Um, and I just think if, it, 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 again, really big numbers we're talking about a couple weeks ago, $100 million. Might have been over 10 years, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, it just seems like a very small fraction of that money. We could get lockers, showers, you know, just some, because a lot of these people aren't even ready to go into apartments yet, right? A lot of them need a transition period. So just lockers, showers, you know, some dignity. Some of the, they've found some dignity on their own. They've created some dignity on their own. And I think with a very, very small amount of money, you could, you could really double, triple, quadruple that dignity level and um, uh, uh, just bring a little more security, be able to bring more people into their system. And um, that land's got to be next to nothing. I mean, they're under a freeway and a dirt patch. So um, anyway, in, any, anything. We're talking, well, I don't know, 50 grand, 100 grand? Like, it's not a big number. Um, so thank you for your time, and thank you for everything all you are doing. Thank you. All right. Um, you've got... Two last speakers uh, here, and then we've got one online. Uh, next speaker is Miss Mary Curry. Um, I've got a card for Miss Mary Curry. I don't, I don't see. Oh, here we go. And then after that, we'll be followed by Miss Tiffany uh, Mangum. Good morning, council members. And thank you for the opportunity. Some of you I have had the opportunity to meet. Others I'm still waiting to get to meet, so thank you for your opportunity that I have to speak today. I was not planning to speak. My intent was just to sit and listen. Having served in a public service as you're doing, I realized that I need to share a little bit of my experience with you. I don't know what your reasons are 
for all the movement and all the in and out. I don't know what they're for. Maybe that's important. However, it's important that people think they're being heard. Even if you don't like the people who are speaking, if you don't like what they're saying, it's important to them that you listen. I've been in situations where people talked and it just drove me insane, but I listened and I showed that I was a public servant that they had put in place. So I'm sharing with you this because I care about you and I want you to look professional, be professional and continue to do your work, but it doesn't look professional when people come to the dais to speak and groups of you just in and out, walking back and forth and visiting. It just doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for me because it makes me hurt for those people who are trying to speak, even if you don't like what they're saying, okay? Uh, the homeless, the disadvantages. Uh, you represent all of Fresno, all the Fresno community. So even if you don't like the people, listen to them, be attentive. And I thank you for that. But I also wanted to mention to you my uh, concern about Ms. Yvonne Spence. I don't know her personally and her work personally, but I've been to many council meetings. She always presented herself in a professional manner seemed to have done her work in a professional manner, never heard any disrespect about her or anything negative about her. So whatever it is, and I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, take it from an old lady who's been around here for a while. I happen to be 90 years old. I want you to know that you need to be more careful and need to reflect on how what you do has an impact on all of us in Fresno. It has an impact on the families of the people that you work with. It has an impact on the people that you let go. We don't know what Ms. Spence's future holds, but I know that uh, she's served Fresno well, and I hope that she's given decency, dignity, and respect in whatever your decisions may be. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Curry. Um, last speaker is Ms. Tiffany. Magnum, if you could just give Ryan a quick, quick second to sanitize, please. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, Council. I am here to speak in opposition to the termination of Miss Yvonne Spence. The time is now where black talent and black leadership need a seat and a voice at the table of decision making. Inclusion at the table of decision making and advancement has eluded us for far too long. Miss Spence exhibited some of the highest levels of professionalism and expertise for years as I've watched online and here in the audience. She was an exemplary leader within the city and abroad for the entire community, let alone for us emerging black leaders in our city throughout our com and throughout our community. Whatever the reasons this leadership, this leadership collective here today and online and throughout our city, stand by Ms. Spence and the other leaders within and external to this city's government. We're here to ensure accountability for our place in helping to lead our city government and this community. We've helped build and bring critical resources, expertise, and leadership in times of triumph and crisis. We're here, excuse me, we've been here. No longer is it enough to act, activate equity voyeurism where the bare minimum, minimum is enacted to make us feel or look good but to move strategically and to be intentional about addressing the anti-blackness that pervades our community. No longer are we interested in showing up as the supporting cast, but as leaders like Ms. Spence did every day. We're more than qualified, not just able, but we're qualified to shift the tide for the next generation of innovators and leaders like myself. Council members, there should be no fear or hesitation in doing what is right and taking the necessary steps to ensure a more equitable Fresno for us all. As a former city staffer and black community leader and a lifelong resident of the city, make room and do not silence the qualified excellence we as black leaders bring to the city for the benefit and elevation of us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. City Clerk, do we have Ms. Lisa Flores on? She will be our, our last uh, speaker. Can you, can you cue her up, Ms. Flores? Um, Flores? Hi, Louie, can you hear me? We can hear you, ma'am. Okay, uh, first off, I can't see you at all, and I called in over an hour ago just to let you guys know that. Um, so will that person be fired as well? Um, my first um, issue at hand is fireworks. 
I don't know about you, but I survived the siege of 2021 for four and a half hours. What got me really, really concerned this year is I was laying in bed and there goes a, a rocket on a tree line neighborhood where trees line up both sides of the neighborhood. And, you know, I hate to ask this, but is there any way we seriously can consider banning fireworks in Fresno? Because I'm really tired of the mortars going off and uh, tripping my heart, because, uh, you know, I got the valves. Um, the second issue is Yvonne Spencer. I cried when you guys dismissed her. I was like totally shocked and dumbfounded because I'm trying to think, you know, as a to fire her, um, to terminate her employment, because I know sometimes I am not the most, um, I can be difficult at best, but every time I've dealt with Yvonne, I will tell you she was and still is the best of the best of all all the people I've ever had to deal with at City Hall. And, you know, I will tell you, I cried a little. My heart goes out to her. I pray for her every day. What was the reason? And, you know, to me, as a resident, as a taxpayer, I would really will never know because it was an employment issue. But it's just such bad form, guys, such bad form. You know, and I just look at if the organization failed to give her what she needed to perform her job, this is, it's on the organization and you. Um, second, the gentleman with the pride flag, I don't know about, and under my rainbow flag, as an ally of 46 years, I welcome everyone. And I will pray for your soul when you meet Jesus and my mother, Mexican woman, she'll have a chunk in her hand. And I want to actually thank Mother Mary Curry for actually chunking all you guys today on um, the treatment of residents and actually actively listening to the community. Because, you know, you would have heard my call for safe camps months ago. And I don't know what it takes, whether it's need to the community, because a lot of times the community will come to you. They will voice their concerns and give you solutions to the problems. But if you're not open and active, you're gonna waste everybody's time, time and money, anywhere from six months to a year. So I would, I'm supporting what Mother Mary Curry has said and being open issuance and the residents and the taxpayers of Fresno, because that was what you were elected to do. And if you can't do it, then maybe you should find another job. Anyway, I thank you very much, Louie, and I hope to see your face. Thank you uh, for that, Ms. Uh, Flores. Um, we will now conclude public comment. I will bring it back up to the dais. Councilwoman Soria, you were punched up. Do you have some comments or questions? Yeah, I had, I, I think, some question for the administration because I am kind of concerned that we have a handful of homeless individuals, people that are unsheltered in this room right now. And while the mayor, you know, reported that 100 people were taken off the freeway. I'm wondering why folks like the folks that are here today are being overlooked as part of this program. Um, I would want you guys to actually go take down their names and put them in the, mo the next motel room that is available. That, that would be my desire. Thank you for that, Councilman Soria. Um, let's actually move on with the city business, which is quite a marathon of public comment. We've been at it for over an hour and 20 minutes. Um, yes. Council, but, Council but, President. Yeah. Oh, city manager. I think we were asked a question, so I just want to just kind of respond real quick. Sure. If you don't mind. Yeah, so as we went through it with the, uh, through the budget process, what we had identified was the homeless strategy going forward was clear the freeways uh, first, 
public safety, fires, damage, it was, that was the priority. And then we talked about building the heart team and you guys thankfully funded that, so I appreciate that. Um, and we're in the process of buying the equipment, hiring the staff, and as we presented to you guys during the budget process was, after we get the freeways cleared, protect the schools, do what we have to do around the schools, protect the parks, do we have to protect the parks, get into the neighborhoods, protect the neighborhoods. So that's been the sequence we've been talking about for about three, four months, and so that's the process we're, we're going down as we hire the people, get the equipment and the materials. So I understand that, city manager. So do I have to tell those folks to go on a freeway so that they can get housed? No. So, 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 that, that, that's, so they're here telling us that they, they, can you guys raise your hands if you guys would take a motel room tonight? So Three. I don't understand why we, could, we couldn't get them a motel room tonight so that they could also be part. Otherwise, it seems like we're telling them, in order for us to give you a motel room, you have to go and be on a freeway. That's and not that's, that's not the message that I, as a council member, am trying to send. So I would ask respectfully if you guys could take down their contact information and try to put them in line to get a motel room. Yeah. As, as we talked about, the priority was the freeways, go after the schools, do the parks, do the neighborhoods. That's the strategy we're pursuing to, to, to adjust that. We'd want to have a bigger discussion about what does that adjustment look like? Because then everybody's going to say, well, hey, don't do the schools, don't do the park, don't do the, jump, let me jump the line. So I, I want to just make sure we're very careful on City how manager, we proceed if, that, proceed if, through that. If I may, if, if you guys can just be respectful, uh, Des. Um, we, we've had this discussion several times and we know it's the mayor's priority to clear people from the freeways where they can be seen by the passenger vehicles. But it hasn't been the priority to house people on the freeways on the residential side of the freeways where they cannot be seen by the freeway passengers. So we agreed on a strategy and to fund that strategy, but on a daily basis, this building also reprioritizes based on the urgency. So what we're asking you is, if you can reprioritize the people that are here today, speaking up and saying that they need a motel, there's, we, we just approved the acquisition of two motels. I think it's fair to say that there's plenty of rooms for at least a handful of people that are here today to be housed without, even if it means that you delay the 99 cleanup by a week, I'm okay with that. It just, it's very disheartening to have approved hundreds of millions of dollars when somebody comes and asks for help, you say, go to the back of the line because right now you're not up. So if, if you can reprioritize so that the council doesn't have to come back with the policy to reprioritize it for the administration, there's a handful of individuals that clearly need help. They're elderly, they're vulnerable, it is a health and safety danger for them to remain where they're at. So if we can just do that administratively, um, and then we, we will have a broader debate when we discuss the latest motel that we've acquired um, in a, an hour or so. And I, I think, I think the, the intent, we completely understand the intent, but as you just exercised there, you went through some criteria. They're here, they're this, they're elderly. And so we just haven't had the discussion with you about what are those criteria when people show up outside of that process. We just wanna make sure we're careful and not you know, start excluding other people now. City manager, let me see if I, let me see if I can land this because this is what I'm hearing from you. You're, you're saying that by way of policy, this body had agreement with you on that priority list. My colleagues just asked you to serve this population. Uh, do you need as a city manager some kind of a policy direction on that? Would that help the situation or can you do it administratively? I guess uh, we, we can do it administratively. We just need okay. to, it's, it's like we've talked about in other things. It's the slippery slope. It's can of worms, it's the Pandora's box. How, how do we then respond to other people that said, oh, I just have to go to city council chambers, speak, and so I just want to make sure we're just careful. No, uh, absolutely. And, and, so and make sure and, we're careful. And my colleagues are correct. Things change, situations change. I think whatever we decide to do, we need to build in some flexibility correct, to totally. adjust to what the needs are, and I think we can get there. I agree. I, I, that, I agree. We're all saying the same thing. We just want to have a discussion about what that process We're all saying the same thing. Yeah, and okay. city manager, just for the final point, Today's agenda also includes half a million for the Marjorie Mason Center, 250,000 for breaking the chains that were not part of this strategy that we approved a few weeks ago. So on a daily basis, things come up that we have to revisit, reprioritize. So if we can find 750,000 for those two organizations that I know the mayor has a close relationship with, 
we can find a way to house a couple of people today. Yep, we're, we're all saying the same thing here. I, I our, agree. Our, you, our, just, you just need to just make sure we're... Uh, absolutely. Yeah, our, we're all right, city manager, talk. colleagues, let's get back on track because we've got quite a bit of material to cover today. Um, so let's move on. Public comment is now closed. Um, do I have a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar uh, and entering Second. into the record the uh, recusal of myself or 1L? So I have a motion by Councilmember Carbasi, second by Councilwoman Soria. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go on to contested consent. Uh, I believe Councilmember Maxwell, you had a couple of items. Let's start with item 1I. Who do we have on staff that's going to answer questions for item 1I? I believe it's the reject all bids for the Fresno Area Express. Would that be uh, Assistant City Manager Barfield? Good or, morning. Brian Barr, Assistant Director. Department all right, Councilmember Maxwell. Yeah, good morning. Um, surprise, surprise. I have a couple questions about the bus. Is the, in the memo, is the cost 180000 per each bus and the fleet for a total of 118 buses, or is it $180,000 for 18 BRT buses? Uh, 180000 well, first of all, um, this is a, a pilot just for the BRT. Route. Understood. Um, when we take a look at the costs and everything we've learned here, we, we extend it to the 118th fleet that we have now. Uh, it's 180, 180 approximately uh, thousand annually in just support. That for doesn't the, include any installation. For, for the 18? For the, the 118. The, on the entire fleet. If Because the end goal here, we all, we all are aware of this, the end goal is to put Wi-Fi on our entire fleet. Okay. You know, back up several years ago, all the way to 2015, it was just going to be a BRT project. It got pulled out because it was over budget, um, and now we've been trying to do that. We've been trying to pilot it on BRT to see, see how we can do this. And what, what we've really learned from this, this strategy, this procurement strategy, is that it's too expensive if we go to that full end game. Um, so far, therefore, we got to pivot. And, and the strategy now is to work with the carriers to find an affordable solution. And, you know, I'm happy to hear to report that we have one major carrier interested that we'll be meeting with very shortly to see, you know, how we can do this. And that's the strategy we're focusing on now. So when we were up here a few weeks ago during the budget hearings, it was confirmed over and over that the reason that we did not have Wi-Fi on our fleet was not a financial reason whatsoever, right? You know, I offered to make a motion for whatever the cost would be to cover Wi-Fi on our entire fleet. And I was told by no means is this a financial constraint. It is purely a cybersecurity issue. Yes. But that's not what I'm understanding here today. What I'm understanding here today is that it is indeed a financial issue. And of course, we're done with the budget hearing. So I'm not understanding why there's that discrepancy between what I heard during the budget and what I'm hearing here today. So it, it, it's, there's two different issues there. Um, the cybersecurity issue is, getting back up in time to 2017, um, we were able to put some equipment on our BRT fleet that is dual purpose. One, it can help with uh, tra traffic signal priority, which it does, and two, it can al also broadcast Wi-Fi. But we put that into the test environment here at ISD, and our, our wonderful folks here were able to hack into that and get into the city systems um, when they weren't supposed to which is a major problem. So we, we can't utilize that technology, which we have on, on a third of our fleet at this point, to support TSP uh, because of that security risk. There's, there's no way around that. Um, so in terms of why we're here tonight, why we're not doing this today is a sustainability issue and a quality of service issue. If reading through that staff report, you'll find that the lowest bidder, which we're basing these numbers on, has a 23 gigabyte cap per bus per month. I don't know about you guys, but I use 10 gigabytes alone for myself. After the 23 gigabytes is up, you know, it's, it's reduced speeds and it's not a great experience for our customers. How long is the RFP out there for bidding purposes? How long did it flow out out there? And how many uh, responses did you get? We got... Six responses, and it was out there for about two months. About two months. So why not, I, I understand some of the concerns you brought forward, you know, data cap, some financial issues. Why couldn't we 
just to see how it works, start it on a few buses on our BRT fleet until we're able to find somebody. It could take a whole year before we could find a vendor that's willing to bid on something that meets our data requirements and our financial requirements. Why couldn't we do this test pilot for a year, knowing that there's limits when it comes to the data? Again, it's, it's about the end game and achieving that overall goal. You know, if we were to go forward with this pilot, we have a vendor coming in to put in their equipment on our fleet. Um, and while we'd be working in the background and trying to do it again with somebody else, doesn't make sense. Um, especially, again, for the quality of service issues. That would most certainly be a problem at the beginning. What's the plan? What's the plan? Right, you know, like I said, we we're pivoting our strategy. We have met, well, we've met with one of the three major carriers. I'd rather not say it in public forum, but they are interested in learning more and possibly doing this venture with us. I don't have any more details to share because we have to meet with them and that's coming up very shortly. Okay. okay. I think at some point the transportation subcommittee is going to have to make a hard decision whether, you know, if we're not able to do this internally for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, bidding issue, you know, data capacity, financial, internally, that we're going to have to make a difficult decision as to whether we want to start partnering with some private folks that have reached out to us and that have assured us that they're able to get the job done. I know there is a lot of interest out there, and I just know that we can't wait another five years. We can't wait another 10 years. I've only been on this council for six months, but I've seen this issue kick down the road since, you know, I moved back into Fresno in 2016, and I'm not willing to see that happen again. And so I do want a detailed plan from the administration as to what the progress is, what's the timeline, when are you planning on reaching these goals, and we need to have a contingency plan if we're not able to meet those goals because this is an important issue to me, it's an important issue to my colleagues and to my constituents. I did, you know, before I hand it over to my colleagues for a comment, I, I wanted to point something out, and I wasn't going to, but it did kind of bother me. When I was reading through the staff report, um, I read something interesting. It, it said that the most current facts in a handy ride customer service satisfaction survey conducted in 2018 revealed the top five most important transit quality qualities to riders, and those are on-time performance, frequency, time to complete trip, safety, and hours of operation, implying that Wi-Fi and internet were not important issues toward drivers. But I printed out and I took the survey myself, nowhere in here does it give Wi-Fi or internet as options to select as whether those are priority issues. And there's neither a blank value to fill in to say that that's an important issue. And then on top of that, there's a point that's made in the staff report that says 79% of riders have access to internet daily. You know, so what? Again, I'm not sure why this, this information is listed in here. I don't see how it's germane to the conversation we're having. To me, it almost seems like the administration is pivoting to say that Wi-Fi is not a priority for us because it's not a priority for our riders when there's nowhere in the survey in 2018 for folks to indicate that that is a priority for them. And so there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between the robust conversation we've had out here in public forum during the budget hearings for the past several years versus what I'm reading in the staff report. I'm not sure why that's in here to begin with. It sounds like the administration is pivoting away from uh, the notion that that's an important feature. And I'll conclude my remarks with that. Uh, if, if, if I may, Council President, yeah. can I just get a straight answer from the administration? Are you guys just engaged in a passive aggressive strategy not to do Wi-Fi? Or, because the reason I ask, all seriousness, we, we just approved a million dollars for a new gate for the bus system. That was never a discussion point, but it was a priority for the administration. I'm sure there's good reasons for it, and we found a million dollars to do it. So I've been here two and a half years, and I keep on getting reasons why Wi-Fi is not possible, but I came from Fresno Unified where we did Wi-Fi in all the buses years ago. So is, do you guys really not want to do this, and you're just stringing us along, or no, I'm not are, are aware there going to be hard, yeah. hard deadlines to get this done? Yeah, I'm not aware that we're not. There's, there's no, there's no discussion about not being interested in doing it. So I can, I can put that, I can assure you that. I, I do can tell you that, uh, you know, as part of coming into the new administration, 
We have made it a priority for all the department heads that um, all of the software, hardware, uh, technology devices that they have, we don't want to get caught in a ransomware situation. Okay, that is a absolute, don't cross that line. And so that has been the, 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 what I put out to these guys. And so they might be a little bit afraid of that. Yep. You know, I apologize if I've done that to them, but we can't have people hacking into this system. So that is a priority for us to protect the system. My understanding is that, the, you know, the technology we looked at as part of this was vulnerable. We cannot. And, and city manager, I, I think this council agrees because we've funded yep. our ability to defend ourselves and we get all the memos on how successful we're defending ourselves through our IT team. But a school district has extremely sensitive information too. And years ago, they figured out how to do it. And we've been approached by companies from Bitwise to others, guaranteeing that they can get this done overnight. And we've been respectful of the administration saying, go through them. We, we've already agreed to, the, to fund it, to prioritize it. And it just seems like there's no traction. And so where do we stand? Because I don't want to debate this for another two years. No, I don't want to do it another two years either. Yeah. So let me, let me chime in here because uh, when, you, when you reference the administration, you, you fail to look me in the face. So I'm still the director of facts. The administration. Okay. And, and a part of the administration too. But I, I do want to say that this bid right here is the vulnerable bid. And that's why we're rejecting these bids. This equipment that we have, the cradle point system, is the vulnerable system. So that's why we pivoted to go back to the vendors, just like you asked, council member. You asked for us to go back to the vendors, and that's what we've done. And so, w working with ISD directly, we have a vendor, a major corporate vendor, who's interested in working with us. So allow us to do that work. So assistant city manager, to be clear, because we've allowed you to do that work for two and a half years without closure and progress, how long before you tell us what the secret negotiations or the secret vendor is and bring something back for us. Is it 60 days, a year? How much time do you all need to bring that conversation to close? Uh, what would you say, Brian? 60 days? Okay, 60 days. And right. I, I would That's also fair. add, Assistant City Manager, that I understand that you're doing what you're doing on the administrative side, but if that's not made visible to the council, you have to expect a certain level of frustration. We're just seeing no progress over years and years we don't know what's happening behind the scenes, and that's why we have this open public forum to try to get a better understanding. But, but council member, you fail to understand that in 30 days since council member Soria asked us to go back to talk to the major carriers, we've done that in 30 days, less than that even. I appreciate that fact. So, but th these bids are from December of 2020, and, and this was what we tested, and it was vulnerable to the system. And Fresno Unified is not tied to their system, their, their servers. Our buses have to be tied into our servers because of the, G, the GPS and the communications technology. That's not the case of Fresno Unified. All right, colleagues, I think you had your questions uh, answered, unless you have more questions. I think that last no. question probably landed. Council President, from my perspective, the administration has indi clearly indicated 60 days they'll have resolution, so we'll look forward to a 60-day mark. All right, Councilmember Maxwell, did you want to uh, make a motion to reject the bids? I will make that motion, right. Council President. I'll second, second that. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go to item 1M, uh, also by Councilmember Maxwell. Okay, this is regarding the revocation of massage parlor license that was introduced to council at the last meeting. I did have a productive conversation with Assistant City Manager White um, earlier this morning. I would like to make um, a friendly amendment to this motion. So this is going to be under Section D, effective date of suspension or revocation. I would like to change it to say suspension our revocation will be effective 10 days from the date the notice was personally delivered or 10 days from the date notice was mailed. Is that acceptable to administration? Yes, that's fine. Okay, well then I'll make that motion to make those changes and to, um, I guess, essentially treat this as the reintroduction of this item as well. Motion made by Councilmember Maxwell with those modifications. Do I have a second? Second by Councilwoman Soria. Any opposition? 
Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go to item 1N, uh, also by Council Member Maxwell. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion to approve the folks doing good work at Marjorie Mason Center are you know, desperate need of these funds. But I did want to ask you know, either administration or the folks on the COVID committee who I think oversee the ERAP funds, who all was reached out to to receive these funds? Do you have that list? And, and how did you decide which organizations to reach out to? Was there an RFP? Was there an RFQ? If not, what discretion was used in the outreach? Yeah, so the, uh, we reached out to, on the, on the um, element related to domestic violence, we reached out directly to Marjorie Mason because 60% of their occupants come from the police department. So we thought, okay, let's go. And we've done work with them, and it was consistent with what we've been doing. And we had just gotten new guidance from the um, Treasury that the monies they had originally awarded to us, the $15 million, they had originally indicated that you know, 10% could be used for administration to get the money out. And then they said, came back later and said, you can also use 10% of that money for housing stability services. That kind of changed everything. Like, okay, let's hurry up and get this money out. So we worked with the COVID committee. There was, um, there, on the domestic violence, we talked directly with uh, Marjorie Mason just to keep them going, what they've been doing. On the human trafficking, we had talked with uh, Breaking the Chains because they had also been doing this work for the police department. We had talked to another organization, um, I think that you had identified for us, the, I, forget the, I, I apologize, I forget the name of the organization, but in talking with them, we really need to put them into the um, category where we have the, um, the ARP, ARPA funding because they were gonna need about a million dollars just get started up and facilities and programs. So we thought, okay, we're gonna come back to you as part of this. Breaking the change for 250,000 could go ahead and just start processing and using that money. And then we worked with the COVID committee, talked to them about the three. You say you're working with the COVID committee. Does that mean there's a consensus from the committee to reach out to these organizations? Or what does that mean? Yeah, so we just present that to them as the group. Just say, you know, hey, here's the money. We got the new guidance from Treasury. Here's what we, that money could be used for. The other part of the money could be used for the um, eviction protection program. So we awarded 750,000 to the city attorney's office. They went and got that taken care of. Uh, or they're getting that taken care of. Um, I don't know that there's a formal vote. We just, here's, here, here's the guidance, here's what we're doing, everybody good, and then we just, we'll come back to you and give you the updates on what we're, as we get the contracts ready. Thank you, City Manager. All right, motion was made by Councilmember Maxwell, seconded by Councilmember Carbossi. Any opposition? I do have questions. Can I, yeah. we, we do have questions, Council, Councilmember Soria? And so then Councilmember just, Arias. you know, for folks that, um, made comments just right now with Councilmember Maxwell. Um, this was an issue that I actually raised to the administration because in conversations with families who don't necessarily, um, didn't necessarily qualify just for the rental assistance program, but we're struggling and we're kind of in limbo and we wanted to prevent people from becoming homeless. And so, you know, I asked the administration to look at how much money. I think this is only the partial amount this is partial, yeah, it was 1.5 million total of the 15 we got from the treasury, 750,000 we, we worked with the city attorney's office and then 750,000 is between breaking the chains and Marjorie Mason. And then we got additional information today about additional monies available from the treasury and those have even expanded uses. So we'll bring that to the COVID committee for additional services we can provide. Yeah, I think this is extremely critical. I also, um, I think had brought up um, because I got contacted by Central Unified, the parent engagement program, and there's several families that are right now at the verge. Well, they're homeless, but they're, they don't meet the definition, and I think these types of dollars will help those families. So I'm hoping that Marjorie Mason Center, you can reach out to both Central Unified, the parent engagement program, and then also Fresno Unified for those families that have kids that are either living in a garage um, or are having to be piled up in a very small home because they, they lost their primary home. So they're not literally homeless, but, um, or fit the, def the definition that the federal government um, outlines, but um, are definitely in need of um, stable shelter. So that's what I'm hoping um, this can accomplish. So I'm grateful that we're able to move this issue forward today. Right, Councilman Bradias. Thank you, Council President. I have a couple of questions on the actual scope of work. Um, we, we just heard from Des Martinez and some of the homeless residents. I know she houses in that encampment, victims of domestic violence and victims of human trafficking. 
So are the providers planning to in any way reach out to those encampments and, and offer housing, or are you simply going to rely on the police department's referral system for this specific pot of money? Correct. Yes, please come up. It would be helpful to hear from the providers. I can only speak for myself. Um, I'm in regular communication with Des Martinez um, when there are survivors that need assistance, um, and she has all of our materials there as well. Um, and council members, sorry to ask you, answer your question as well. Um, we take anybody and make sure that they get triaged through our 24-7 crisis response and get them connected to um, any provider that is they're eligible for. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find out more specifically. This half million dollars funds 29 um, motel rooms for 184 nights with three meals a day. So my specific question is, if there's domestic violence victims referred to you from whatever encampment, including the Des Martinez encampment, will they receive a room um, through your agency in this contract? We t yes, we take everybody th okay. through who comes through any avenue. We run the domestic violence coordinated entry system that parallels the non-domestic violence coordinated entry system. So we take individuals from all aspects, not just directly from Fresno PD. So the answer is yes. Okay. And my other question is, this is a city funded effort. Would county residents be served under this agreement or are you receiving funding from the county of Fresno to also house victims of domestic violence from Reedley, Sanger, Fowler, and Clovis? So my understanding is the genesis do I need to wear this? No, you like don't. I, I'm so sorry. It's like okay. <laughs> and, the, and the reason I asked, Nicole, is, yeah. as you know, we got $35 million, The county got $35 million, which means that they can also use their funding to match what we're doing. And there are victims of domestic violence that need housing in the neighboring other cities. So are you receiving any money from the county's ERAP funds for this? That particular bucket of funds, no. Okay. So... Um, that, that, do you want me to answer the first question? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. okay. So um, going back to last year, obviously, I was in communication with most of you, and um, I just wanted to publicly say thank you. When the COVID pandemic hit, we were feeling like it was um, a, a, a secondary crisis because domestic violence was going up, and we didn't have the mechanism to also keep people safe from abuse but also from COVID. And so I just want to publicly thank those of you who were here last year at that time who really stepped up. Um, my understanding is that this was another opportunity. We spent all those funds and we served thousands of people yeah. um, during that time with thankfully no person-to-person -person spread. So that was the goal and that this is an intent to carry that over. Um, all of our, um, all of the clients that we serve get to report and then they get to, I, we have lots of conversations, so they report where they came from um, and is kept in our system. And so like we did with the CARES Act funds last year, we re provide a report back to the city with who was served and that they're all city of Fresno residents. Yeah, I understand. I, I just want to yeah. make sure that I know there's more need. Absolutely. And there's We're limited the funds from, my, from us. <laughs> so I'm going to encourage my counterparts in the county of Fresno to also use the flexibility of ERAP to provide direct assistance to the victims of domestic violence and human trafficking the way we are doing today. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you all very, very much. And Good with that, point. I have no other questions. All right, a motion was made, a second. Uh, any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go to item 1-0. I believe that's Vice President Sparsa pulled item 1-0. Yes, so, uh, you know, for the benefit of the, the public, uh, I'd like for the, I'd like for staff to sort of paint a picture of the direction that we're headed at these two parks, um, what it'll look like uh, coming in, paying for your parking, et cetera. Absolutely. Good morning, Council Member. Thank you for the opportunity. Jennifer Clark, Planning and Development Director. Um, so last September, um, the Council approved a, um, uh, an agreement with both Vigilant and Parkeon to provide um, pay on foot stations. So these are kiosks that would be placed throughout Woodward and Roading Parks um, in um, parking areas. Um, similar to what you would see at Fresno State. So a pan foot station where you can pay for your parking um, for the day or for a pass or something else. Um, as well as a fixed license plate reader system so that when um, a person enters, a vehicle enters the park, they no longer have to stop at the entry booth to um, pay for the day. 
Um, and there's no longer that challenge of, I'm just dropping off my kid at a birthday party, or um, I'm, I'm picking up someone from work, right? So they would be able to enter into the park, find their parking place, go to the station, pay for the day, or enter in their um, information that's associated with their annual pass, and then they're free to go about the park. So it, it improves um, kind of that process and that flow for individuals coming into the park on, on a daily basis. So is there still going to be uh, any kind of barrier at all, like where they, pr they take a ticket and the uh, handle moves up, or is it just No, wide so open? It, will be, it will be free flow into the park. Um, there will be a transition period. Park staff and ACE parking will both be available during that transition period that will train um, customers when they come to the park how to use the system and how it works. Um, and our anticipation is that probably after about a 30 to 45 day transition period, we would be able to um, uh, remove ACE entirely from both Roading and Woodward Parks. Okay. Um, so in terms of parking enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, is there going, are we going to see an increase uh, in, in enforcement or is it sort of, I mean, how, how is it enforced or monitored? Right. So um, monitoring is so on a, on a daily basis um, in um, both of those park areas, we have two parking controllers who work those beat areas. Um, they will receive notifications from the system that will let them know how many entries into the park, how many ent potential entries um, have not paid after a certain period of time. So we have um, kind of a grace period um, of, uh, that, that's set by the city. We're anticipating somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 minutes to an hour, which allows people to do what I just said earlier, like drop someone off or, or pick someone up without having to pay at that entry gate. Um, and um, they would get a notification. There are approximately five suspected um, uh, non-payments in the park. They would be able to make a run-through if we felt that that was legitimate enough to make a run-through at that point in time. So we'll be evaluating that on a regular basis. What are we seeing as um, is, a, is a high number or a low number? Um, you know, I would anticipate, you know, five, less than 10 would probably be a low number, as many parking spaces as that we have at both of those parks. If we had 25, 30 or more, then we'd probably do a run through. So the anticipation is to utilize our current parking staff to do those, um, those runs through the park to ensure that, that um, we can pick up any non-payment, um, but we don't anticipate that um, it will increase um, workload. So these, well, these two park staff per park, so that's four staff in total. Well, there par, for, there, there's two in a beat, which includes roading, and there's two in a beat, which includes Woodward. But we're not talking about two FTE, it's just part of, just part of their beat. They're part of their beat, correct. Okay. Uh, and how many of the uh, stations, the pay stations, um, do we know, have an exact number for roading and exact number for Woodward? Right, so this, this particular uh, um, enhancement to the agreement that you're approving adds three cameras along with their integration and um, warranty. So um, it's, it's a little over $8,000 each to add those cameras. We currently have um, eight total. So um, there would be at each entry um, currently at Woodward and Roading, we would have the ability to have um, two lanes in and two lanes out. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I was concerned about sort of the cost benefit of, okay, removing the kiosk and removing, I assume there was one or two FTEs per... Um, right. So the, the big cost savings to the Parks Department um, is about $50,000 monthly for um, Woodward and Roading combined for our annual, or excuse me, our monthly cost to ACE. So they'll be saving about 600000 annually. So um, in about four months, this will pay for itself. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. All right, I'll make a motion to approve. Director? Yes. Uh, may I ask, you, if we're heading into the direction of embracing technology, why not just fully embrace it and cut out the folks manually going around issuing tickets while families are there having a picnic? Why not have some sort of system like we've seen in other cities where it could be directly mailed to that person? 
That, you know, that is an option. What I'd like to do is after we implement the system, let's see where we're at after about six months and come back and have that conversation. Um, I'm certainly open to that. Seems like there might be some upfront costs, but maybe some long-term savings with an option sure. such as that. Yeah. Well, Council President, I'll second the motion, but you do have some questions. All right, thank you for that. Uh, uh, motion was made by Vice President Sparsa, seconded by Councilmember Arias. Did you have any questions, Councilmember? I Arias? do. Yeah. Um, so d I, I would uh, reaffirm Councilmember Maxwell's uh, point, because if you've ever been at Roading or Woodwork on Easter, the last thing you want is to create a confrontation with patrons over a t somebody physically giving them a ticket when you can simply put it in the mail and not create that situation because um, family barbecues invite all the families and sometimes the uncles and are not as you know patient as you would expect after being in the heat all day with crying kids. So I'd rather not put our city staff in that situation Code enforcement already does that on a daily basis, and I don't think our parking staff or ACE parking needs to be in that scenario. So if you can expedite the you know, mail ticket versus a physical ticket and in-person interaction, that would be preferable. Um, and then secondly for me, uh, I'm assuming that this will also require the numbering of all the parking stalls so that people can p punch in in what spot they're parking in. Currently, the way the system is worked out is not to do that. So we have the um, license plate recognition system. So essentially, all it does is know what the number is, X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four. And then it sends that number to our system. And as the, um, the parking vehicle goes through, it says, oh, there's that car. You stop. Did they have a hanging tag that perhaps was not identified in the system rather than a plate for a disabled parking? Okay, that's not a violation. Move on to the next vehicle. So we are not numbering the, numbering the, the, uh, the stalls. The same? Right. Okay. And then uh, road, 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 roading parks specifically for me, mm -hmm. prior to the parking booths, there used to be multiple entrances into the park. Um, I understand with your presentation that we're now going to still keep two entrance points only to roading? Currently, we have two entrance points. The anticipation is we would be able to reopen our additional based upon the, the roading park master plan that was revised as it relates to um, high-speed rail, uh -huh. right? So it, it's changed some of those entrance points, but that would allow us as we um, roll out the system to, to add these three cameras. Okay. So at some point, once we, we will coordinate with the changes of high speed rail, right. the traffic, the roundabout that's there, and then it would allow for um, in the future to open up more entrance yes. points to the park. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for the time and thank you for embracing innovation and technology in the city. Vice uh, President. Director, uh, so my colleague brings up a good question. So in going back to, I guess, is piecing it together as you've described it, uh, the license plate reader will pick up the numbers as they come in. So that'll be sort of one list. So this is the inventory of what's entered. And then as folks punch in their information of the machine, that'll be, that, that's what matches up, matched up against mm -hmm. in terms of uh, directing where the enforcement goes? Correct. Okay. And then how, how, I mean, how often, how up to date will that data be for uh, the parking uh, division enforcers is that are they carrying like an iPad with like uh, mo the most up-to-date information at all times or is, is kind of a lag how does that work right so um, and and um, I am not as familiar with the with the system but it is um, relatively up-to-date within 30 minutes okay so every 30 minutes they refresh and yeah. okay yeah all right my motion all right motion was made second do I have any opposition Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go on to item 1R, Council Member Maxwell. Director Clark, I might need you up here for <laughs> another moment, please. It's regarding the local housing trust fund. Um, I had raised uh, a concern during our meeting earlier this week, and I don't think I received an answer. But before I vote on this, I just want to know what happens if a future council diverts our annual real estate tax away from this matching yep. grant program is all the money that we've received from matching funds from the state level going to have to go back to the state do we get to keep that i just want to know because never know what the next council might do absolutely 
So um, Casey has been researching that for us. Give me just a second to see if she has an answer. Thank on you, that. Director. Um, so, it, the guidelines right now are somewhat unclear, and um, that, but essentially what, what they want to see is that there is an ongoing source, right, for the fund. Because um, the housing trust fund, like any trust fund, is only really good as long as it still has money in it, right? So, if you empty your bank account, you can't keep um, implementing the activities. What they have asked for is essentially evidence that uh, our ongoing source would fund the um, housing trust fund for a period of five years. So after the five years, um, there, as long as there is funds to continue that operations for five years, whether it's this source, a different source, um, repayments into the fund, it wouldn't necessarily have to be this source. Gotcha. Thank you, Director. Yeah, Director, I think I'd ask you very similar questions during our meeting about, um, you know, what happens if we there's a certain amount inserted um, and then we get the matching funds and then we spend a certain amount. Um, you know, how much of it is, you know, if we do a one-time allocation at this point uh, versus, you know, uh, in addition to the ongoing, right? So, I mean, as you're researching, I mean, th those questions are, I appreciate getting those answered, but it sounds like, uh, it's not clear and it's sort of, you know, they're, they're sort of taking it in stride, I, I guess you would say, the state. Um, is, is this matter time sensitive today? What is our deadline to apply for the, um, yeah, for the so, funds? Yeah, so our deadline to apply is um, at the very beginning of August. Um, so at most, this could be deferred to the next meeting, um, but we can't defer beyond that. Well, I, I, I asked, just in terms of looking in other, for other sources, right, to, to punch into uh, this fund, you know, the, the more the better in terms of how much we could apply for, so. Absolutely, uh, so I would, I would actually, um, the city manager had a really great idea to increase our. I don't um, know, it's a great idea. Potential, <laughs> <laughs> our investment into the fund. So it's it. actually part of your budget already, so go ahead. So for example, you had uh, allocated $3 million of the general fund for the Lingo project. Why don't we deposit it into there and it shows the one and a half the three now we got four and a half. That's what we would that would we would submit to the to the state and say, hey, we got four and a half million. I think the max is five million Correct. that they can. So we can get four and a half million in grants from them to match our our four and a half that we would put in there. So so um, does that change? So does that require a council action or a reallocation on our part? No, because the project itself would be an eligible project based upon um, the application that we're submitting at this time. So um, you've already appropriated those dollars for that specific activity. So it would just be a matter of depositing it into this fund that's created today. I guess I'm a genius. Yeah, you're the yeah, genius. You, that's you, right. You, you that's that right. Way. You're the genius. Council uh, Vice President, I'd just like to point out that the CDBG committee met this week, and there were geniuses before you. <laughs> we raised the same question and actually requested that the item be brought back on the 29th so we can identify more projects that are already funded and committed and draw down as much state money as we possibly can. You want to make that motion, Councilman Rodgers? Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, bring the, the item back on July 29th and have the staff identify additional projects that would maximize the state match. And I would also like to um, review the feedback that we got today from some of the folks on other eligible um, criteria that we can put into the program. Yeah, oh, so... so I'll second it. I appreciate that. Can I can I respond to that last um, comment? So we we did have some public outreach, and there there was a desire 
it, it was a twofold desire, right? Maximize the dollars from the state, but at the same time, there are other things that we'd like to do with the housing trust fund. So again, a housing trust fund needs to be like a revolving fund. Dollars keep going back into this fund to ensure that we're, we keep the fund alive. Um, so one of the, the community conversations was that um, in, go ahead and get these dollars from the state this year and focus on production of new rental housing, but in future years, expand the pool for additional types of things that were addressed today. Yeah, and, 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 um, and I do apologize for missing our CDBG meeting yesterday where you briefed us on it, but I think there's some valid points that have been raised, um, even around you know, acquisition. We're in the process of acquiring a lot of you know, motels. That may be an eligible um, expense downstream. We've already committed money towards that effort. We're probably going to commit another round of money with the next turn, you know, whatever key name of the state <laughs> program is, room key. So we just like to have uh, two weeks to have staff do some research, see if uh, you guys can incorporate some of the feedback that's been given and identify additional money to use this match. I'll, I'll go ahead and second your motion. Uh, so what I would what I would ask the, of the administration and also uh, legal counsel is that uh, in terms of you know utilizing that three million in general funds, um, I just want to make sure we don't rock the boat with that agreement. A lot of work. I mean, 30 days of work went into that agreement. Um, it was different and separate from the other uh, uh, housing funds that we allocated it on that day. Uh, so I just would appreciate a sort of a triple check. Uh, to make sure it's not going to, uh, you know, uh, just going to rock the boat on um, on that project, uh, especially as we await the, um, I guess, results from uh, that July 1st application. And, and I just want to clarify with uh, Director Clark, um, we don't actually have to identify projects at this point, right? No. We just have to, so I think what I'd like to do is tell you that next week we'll come back to confirmation, or two weeks, confirmation of the uh, 4.5 million we can put in there then we can match 4.5. The max we can get is five. So if you don't mind, I'd like to see if I can find another 500,000 to make it a full 5 million so we can ask for the max. So we, we'll bring that to you at the, at the next council meeting. Yeah, that, 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 that works. I mean, if you can, it has to be general funds, I, I believe. So yeah, if you can find that half a million, uh, we maximize, get the total five, that'd be great. Uh, again, my, my main concern is, is yep, not- your project. Uh, yeah, is, and we're, we're sort of in a limbo risk type area with that 3 million already. Um, and we'd sort of be doubling down if we, <laughs> if we moved it over and, you know. All right, that sounds good to me. All right, motion was made to table it, bring it back on the 29th, seconded by Vice President. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go to our last item, item 1S, Council Member Maxwell. Uh, who, who pulled item 1S? Was it Council Member Arias? Right. So, Thank you, Council President. This is the change order for the completion of the renovation of the most recent uh, motel acquired by the city, the Travel Inn. I think H might be here. Um, so just some background, Council, the, the, the Council had approved the purchase, the acquisition of this facility, the renovation. Of course, um, the, there's a change order because renovations were more expensive than we anticipated. For the record, we knew that up front. This was the uh, motel that was in the worst physical condition in the whole corridor. Um, that's what was important for the city to acquire it. Um, and there has been some improvements. I've walked the facility with um, city staff and the operator. Um, so it looks like things are moving along. I do have a couple of questions though. The last update I received was that half the facility would be um, available on July 1st and the other half would be available August 1st. Are we still on schedule with that? Yes. Okay, and then secondly, actually, it's actually a little more than half was available July 1st, and, and then those three buildings, B, C, and D along Parkway, right on Parkway, will be available 1st of August. Yeah. Per no. Let's see, Tim, give us the latest and the greatest on August 12th. August 12th. At the earliest. Okay. I anticipate there's always an adjustment of schedules given that there's a lot of, uh, if, if the public had seen those, the condition of those rooms, they would know that it was basically a complete reconstruction um, based on the previous um, condition of that facility. Um, secondly, the last time we discussed this, we discussed um, adding uh, security, policing services to that corridor, um, given the um, activities in the remaining privately owned um, facilities. 
And just for the council's knowledge, uh, we, we have acquired facilities at the northern part of the corridor and southern part of the corridor. A lot of these individuals, including women and children, must go to public transit stations that require them to um, uh, walk through that corridor. And some of the illicit activity is still taking place in that corridor in non-city um, owned and operated facilities. So city manager, just want to get an update from you on where we're at with a security plan for the quarter so that we don't have to hear from homeless residents that they don't feel safe enough to be housed there and that the safety um, of the area is actually improved um, given that the neighborhood is, has embraced you know, that becoming a location for transitional housing. Correct. So I uh, appreciate you uh, bringing that to our attention in, in response to your comments about the security issues there off-site of the facilities. That's really what the concern was. Um, uh, the chief of police and his deputy chiefs have uh, implemented some uh, patrol changes there, and they have reduced the crime. But it's not enough. So now, starting next week, we're going to do an enhanced uh, law enforcement uh, patrols in that area and just really stay after it and get it. and we what we anticipate and you and I discussed this yesterday was that you know when once we make our actions elements in that community will adjust and so we're just going to keep adjusting to just keep those people yeah. safe that we're housing in that area so I, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention and great please keep us on it and and just are we still on on um, on schedule to make sure that it's paid for by the same resources that we're receiving for housing the individuals I don't want to you know hear that we're taking bike patrols from tower or you know reallocating general fund resources because this is part of the cost of housing our homeless and so it should be paid for by the federal and state resources dedicated to housing the homeless yes and i've committed to the police chief that uh, we will make accommodations to fund this for him with state and federal dollars that have been entitled to us for for these kinds of housing homeless the housing stability yeah services. housing stability is probably the best way yep. to describe it Okay, with that, then um, I'm comfortable making a motion to approve the change, and I'll look forward to the details of the plan that you guys are working on for next week. Um, so, Council President, I'll make a motion to approve. All right, motion made by Councilmember Arias. Second. Well, seconded by Councilmember Maxwell. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. All right, Council, let's move on to item Schedule Council Hearings and Matters, 10 a.m. number one. Uh, this is going to be in Councilmember Carbasi's district. Uh, it's a hearing to adopt a uh, resolution ordinance to annex territory into CFD number nine. Who do we have from staff that's going to present if, or ask, answer questions if needed? Councilmember Carbasi, do you have any questions? Do you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right. Motion made by Councilmember Carbasi. Second by Vice President Sparsa. Let me go out. Anybody from the public? Uh, Brianna, do we have anybody from the public wanting to speak? Seeing none, I'll close that portion. Uh, any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go on to 10 a.m. number two, also a CFD number 11. This is in Council Member Maxwell's district. Council Member Maxwell, do you have any questions? Make a motion to approve, Council President. Second. Right. Council Member Maxwell made the motion. Who was the second? Uh, Vice President Sparsa. Anybody from the public? Brianna punched up to speak on this. Seeing none, I'll close that portion. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. All right, let's move on to 10 a.m. number three. This is a hearing to consider the Club One card room application sponsored by the mayor and the city manager. I believe we got some folks that are gonna be presenting and speaking on this. Who, who are we having up, queued up, city manager? Yeah, uh, good, uh, good morning. Assistant um, Manager Mark. <laughs> we're still in the morning, so good morning. It's morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have before you the um, investigative report by the city manager, which confirms that there are no uh, issues with the proposed card room uh, moving to this location, as well as the two permit holders, um, which would be uh, Kyle and Dana. Um, Kyle is here. Uh, Carl Kirkland is here. And if you have questions or uh, or any uh, uh, items you could uh, speak to him directly and then um, this item uh, is just a hearing uh, and then two weeks the resolution will come back for you to initiate uh, where uh, we will uh, at that point um, grant uh, should you uh, approve you will grant the license um, uh, and the two permit holders uh, will also receive their license They've already paid for everything in advance. That was part of the, as part of the FMC. 
So everything is paid and then we'll make a refund to them on what uh, we, uh, minus the staff time we used. Mr. Kirkland, do you want to come up and maybe give a brief overview and, and speak a little bit about your project? You're more than welcome to. Council President, if, if I may just ask a clarifying question. We typically receive a full staff presentation on projects like this. Are, are we not going to get it? Are we going to get it now or two weeks from now when it comes back as a resolution? Or is there going to be a tray memo? Like what? So you, you did receive a tray memo uh, already on this. Um, and then you also received a brief staff report. Um, we have not done one of these in over 30 something years. So there's really not, um, <laughs> there's really not a process. Um, the, the last time it was done, it was uh, for Mr. Uh, Serrano and Mr. Long. Uh, and then uh, we've only made one change to that, and that was when uh, those two gentlemen could no longer um, uh, oversee the car room operations. We switched them out with uh, Mr. Kirkman. So there's yeah, really and not for a the, whole lot of history here. And, and for <laughs> the benefit of the public, city attorney, there was a term that was used for this process. I think the term was quasi-judicial uh, process. Maybe you could explain that. That's, that's correct. This is the type of matter in which the council should base the decision solely upon the evidence presented in the administrative record. So either in writing in advance or at the hearing. All right. Thank All you right. for that clarification. Mr. Kirkland, do you want to give a brief overview of your project proposal? Sure. And thank you for entertaining me today. Uh, council members, city staff members, we really appreciate it. My name is Kyle Kirkland. I'm the president and part owner of Club One Casino. Uh, we were in continuous operation in downtown Fresno for, as Mr. Barfield mentioned, almost three decades. We were actually cel celebrating our 25th year of operation when the COVID-19 closures hit. Uh, when the closures hit, we, uh, it became apparent to us some of the shortcomings of our location and why it was problematic for us to continue to operate there, both for in the present and the future. We started looking for a new location had actually looked at Granite Park in the past, uh, buildings there that had been built out and knew that the area was sort of underdeveloped or hadn't reached its potential. We made a decision to explore a move there. And as this council knows, you uh, addressed zoning for us in our um, and the Cardroom Ordinance in December, I believe December and uh, late January or February to actually allow for us to consider such a move. Since then, we have undertaken an effort to uh, lo relocate to Grand Park, including the application process with the city of Fresno, both for the permit and for our uh, alcohol licenses to move to the area. Uh, the consideration would be to move to a building located at 3950 North Cedar Avenue. It's what folks know as the old Cabo Wabo space or the old uh, Club Imperial nightclub space. It was a 30,000 square foot building, only 13,000 of it was actually built out and finished. We've uh, leased that space, uh, undertaken up the uh, contract to buy it, uh, have completed a large part of that, but for necessary approvals, we have options on the land on either side. As part of the uh, process, we've reached out to uh, council members. Uh, we've also connected with Councilmember Maxwell's office. He's uh, gracious enough to meet with us and describe the concerns that he had. Uh, we have taken steps to try to address those. I feel like for us at Club One, any, any objections that anyone would have might be ongoing. We, we sort of address things in our operation. I believe we've operated in this city for over two decades with good operation. We've had, uh, we have 300 and something employees in our operation when we're full scale. We're top 10 card room in the state. We generate roughly a million dollars a year in taxes for the city of Fresno under table taxes, about $25 million over the course of our operation. We are also a significant contributor to local nonprofits, including uh, active involvement of me and others in nonprofits in the area. So the, with respect to outreach, we've talked to, uh, as I mentioned, Councilmember Maxwell, he expressed concerns about proximity to the parks, expressed concerns about alcohol service, expressed concerns about parking, um, a few other items as we've gone through. We've tried to address those, believe that some of those we can't, um, you know, are, are fairly expensive and frankly involve uh, the cooperation of others in the complex. I would say that the other businesses in the complex and the, the general feedback that we've had from the public is very strong positive, just based on our track record, our history, our proven 
operation here in the city of Fresno, and also what we've committed to do just in the neighborhood in the time. We've cleaned up trash, we provide 24-hour security and surveillance, we've eliminated graffiti on our building, there was a fair bit of detritus. I know Council Member Maxwell is very active in the green projects in the city. We have 165 trees on property that we've restored and uh, improved the irrigation of and restored them to what I would consider something acceptable. When you walk through our facility or around our facility now, it is very clear that someone's there and someone cares about the complex. So uh, the feedback we've had from others in the complex is strongly positive, frankly, that we'll be there and provide uh, a little bit of structure, a little bit of supervision, um, and continue the track record that we've had in the city of Fresno. I'd be happy to take questions. I appreciate that this is a once in a generation yeah. move for us. It, the last time it was considered was several decades ago. Uh, and it's certainly an important consideration for this council and respect the gravity that y'all would put into a consideration. Thank you for that, Assistant City Manager. I was I was 10 years old when the last yeah, time this yeah. happened, so I feel really good about that. Yeah. You made my day. A any questions from my colleagues? I don't think I see any. The, the one thing yeah. I would like to add, if I could, is uh, we spent roughly 500, about $600,000 to date just improving that area, improving the, the, the facility. The entirety of the project would be, over the course of 18 to 24 months, would comprise roughly $12 million. Um, the, the what's before this council is the consideration to move the card room into that space now, which would include putting it into uh, the working part of the building now, and we have restored that to working order, restored to code, functioning, and whatever. We were very fortunate that it was built out and there was a lot of working equipment and the layout was, would work for us as a card room, but of course we had to get everything, gas flow and electrical and, and the like, so in, in any event. Thank you for uh, thank you for listening. If you do have questions, I'm happy to take them, or you can reach out to me individually at any time. If uh, assuming the city attorney, no questions, me. but I do want to say I appreciate the report that was provided to me by the city manager's office a couple weeks ago, as well as your testimony today, Mr. Kirkland, and we'll be taking both of those into due consideration as prepare to make a vote on the 29th. Thank okay. you for your time. Thank you. Uh, again, Council President, um, yeah. after careful review, uh, the city manager is recommending that one, this proposed cart room will not result in any um, aggravated crime problems, et cetera. Uh, the public, it's not detrimental uh, to the public health. Uh, it's zoned uh, uh, and it's got the fire and all the building things that you need there. Uh, and this, the, uh, this is consistent with uh, this article uh, in the FMC. Uh, we will come back in two weeks with the actual resolution that you will vote on. Um, and um, as you know, Mr. Kirkland, uh, from the, the, the trade memo and the staff report, Mr. Kirkland is already uh, a state holder of a, a card room permit. Um, there's only one in Fresno, uh, in the city of Fresno, and he has it. So he's, this is a, the, merely the application to move the card room and the 51 tables uh, to this new location uh, and then reconfirm uh, uh, his and Ms. Messina's uh, permit holder um, certificate uh, at this new location. Thank you for that, Assistant City Manager. Councilmember Carbasi, do you have a question or? Just a very a brief comment. Um, I'm glad to see that you're working with the council member for his area. I'm going to wait to see uh, where he's headed in this direction. But I just want to say uh, to Mr. Kirkland, um, you know, right now, and you don't have to come up, uh, Mr. but it's fine. But right now, um, we have a lot of federal tax relief. In a couple of years, it's going to dry up, so we're going to focus a lot more on our tax base. Looking from the city perspective, the tax generated uh, from your operation that helps our general fund is essential. And I'm grateful you've stayed in Fresno, um, regardless of where you go. And I have heard you are a very good employer from your employees that I've randomly run into. So the word gets around. And you also are a good partner. And I wish more people were like that because you, I'm an animal person and you do a lot yourself personally for animals. So I think that's a good example of we want to be business friendly, but we also want business people that care and actually do care about the community. It's not just doing it for show. They're doing it because it's their hearts in it. So thank you for staying here and thank you for creating 300 jobs. Thank you, Council Member Carbasi. That concludes our... Uh, Council President, oh, I do have one question course. to staff. Uh, Assistant to State Manager, was the applicant given an uh, at-risk development permit? Because I know it typically takes two to three years to get through this building to you know, build something of that caliber, and the construction's been taking place for some time. So what, 
is this project being done at risk prior to the um, licenses being awarded? Yeah, we'll have the applicant. It's, it's more of a planning question. I don't know how that works. Yeah, if I, if I could, Council Member Ares. Um, the only part of the building that we've actually been restoring is the part that was actually pre-built the entirety of the project. We have had, we've got designs and we get plans and permits right. to do that. But the only thing we've restored is the working part of it and none of which it's basically so, paint, fixing equipment and such. So it's not really a permitted part of that. We have had, you know, folks like ADA coming through fire, the fire department came through and looked just to make sure that we were being respectful to plans and existing. But it really is fixing the existing structure within the permit that was as, plan as permitted and built. Okay, so m maybe staff can educate me, but whenever you're doing renovations of interior, because probably of significant renovations sure. and improvements, does that require a, a building permit of some kind? We went through this yesterday with another applicant, yeah. and uh, since he's not changing the structural elements, he's just doing tenant type improvements, he can go right to the efforts that he's doing right now. Right. If he was going to change the facade, change the parking, right. add more parking, do some structural changes, then he would have to get a development application, go through the DRC, Got but it. he's Got just it. doing a tenant so improvement. So from my understanding, whenever you're doing interior tenant improvements, you don't have to go through the two-year, you know, Correct. Journey in the planning department. Correct. Okay, thank you for okay. clarifying that for me. Thank you. I, I, I can also say that I know our planning staff has been in there, our code staff has been in the building because he's put the building back into uh, a form. Uh, uh, there was a few items that were unpermitted, uh, and Mr. Kirkwood has fixed those. All right, great. All right, seeing no more questions, do, do we have anybody punched up to speak on this matter? Oh, city attorney? Yes, Council. Uh, since this is a quasi-judicial matter, normally there would not be uh, conversations between the council members and the applicant oh. ahead of the hearing. Uh, I think that was not made clear early on, because uh, like we said, this comes up once every 30 years. Okay. But the applicant did acknowledge that there were conversations with council members, and as long as it's disclosed, I think that then the record can reflect that and we're good. Also, since the matter won't be concluded today, suggest the record uh, reflect that the hearing will be continued through the next council meeting when it will be voted on. All right, let's enter that uh, into the record. So do, do we not, we don't have to take a vote today or do we receive the, the report? There is no vote today. There is no vote, all right. It's, e it's, e it's even better, right? No, no public comment uh, either necessary until we. No, you definitely need public comment. Okay, Brianna, do we have anybody? No, none? All right, we'll close that <laughs> official public comment part. Bring it back. Uh, let's go to the last item. It's item 1005. It's the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan. Uh, who do we have? You have Director Carbajal or? No, my name is Peter Maricini. Right. I'm within the uh, Utilities and Planning. Great. You can just give uh, Mr. Ryan a couple of seconds to sanitize, please. All right, go ahead, sir. Are you going to do a, a PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, Is that so where we're, we're loading? So we're just waiting okay. for it to load. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here today, as well as to the members of the public. Uh, today, I will be presenting uh, three items for discussion and for consideration of adoption. Those three items are the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan, the 2020 Water Shortage Contingency Plan. A little closer? Thank you. Uh, as well as an addendum. You're, you're too tall for us. You've got to raise up the podium so that Mike can get closer. Do you hear me better now? Okay, I'll just start from the beginning then. Um, so today we'll be considering three items for, for discussion as well as adoption. 
Uh, the first is the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan. The second is the 2020 Water Shortage Contingency Plan. And the third is an addendum to the 2015 Urban Water Management Plan. These are all mandated by the state. Um, uh, the third item I will not be discussing as much, that's more of an administrative issue uh, as directed by uh, the Department of Water Resources. It, it deals with our relationship with the Delta, although we don't pull water directly from the Delta. Uh, we pull water from the Central Valley Project and that's through an agreement of people who have, have water rights to both the Delta and the Central Valley uh, Project. Um, we fulfilled that requirement, so we both put information in the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan, as well as a, a, amending the 2015 Urban Water Management Plan. So the reasons for doing this are, are first and foremost, it's mandated by the state that we should do this every five years. Uh, for any urban water supplier that provides water to more than 3,000 customers, or provides more than 3,000 acre feet per year. Um, one of the reasons that we do it, uh, it allows the city to have access to state grant and uh, loans uh, related to drinking water, wastewater, and recycled water facilities. So you can think of those such as consolidating with disadvantaged communities to provide water services and wastewater services, um, to expand our recycled water pr uh, program, uh, as well as do some groundwater cleanup throughout the city. Also, uh, we do it to sh be able to provide or sh demonstrate that we're able to provide uh, water services to meet our near and long-term water demands. And, and this document we'll be referring to on future plans, whether it be master plans or planning documents that the planning department puts out. Uh, so that's why it's so necessary. Uh, as a second item, the water shortage contingency plan, the reason that we prepare that is it is a detailed response plan to any foreseeable or unforeseeable water shortage conditions foreseeable being the drought, something that's happening this year, unforeseeable being some catastrophic event. Let's say we have an earthquake that knocks out a conveyance system to get water to the city. It provides a, a kind of step-by-step -step approach of how we'll, how we'll deal with the water shortage. So a broader motivation for the Urban Water Management Plan is a drought that happened in the late 70s. So in the late 70s, the Marin Municipal Water District, which is located just north of San Francisco, they realized they were running out of water within 120 days. And so they rushed to find a solution, and their solution was to build a pipeline across the bridge to connect to the East Bay to pump water over. And so the state recognized that situation and then mandated in the 1983 Water Management Planning Act that all urban water suppliers have to start preparing these plans to demonstrate that they are able to meet uh, the water needs of their community because certainly they don't want that type of situation and we don't want that situation for the city of Fresno. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through the step-by-step -step process that we do to make sure that we are able to meet everyone's demands. And so first we'll take a look at our demands throughout the city and then we'll look at, at the supplies that we have from waste, uh, from, excuse me, groundwater, surface water, and recycled water. So first is looking at our water demand. So the graph that you see on the left, that's our individual water demand, and the graph on the right is the citywide demand. So on the left, you can see that we peaked at one point of 332 gallons per capita per day in 2001. And then uh, the Department of Public Utilities put a lot of great effort in trying to conserve water, as particularly was mandated by the state. You'll see there was two targets for the state. In one, it was 2015, it was 278. And one was 2020, was 247, and we smashed right through those targets through uh, metering programs, through public outreach, uh, through some trying to convert some people's uh, turf into artificial turf, things like that, uh, through plumbing codes. And we got it as low as 188 gallons per capita per day, where we've been about staying steady. We expect that individual water demand to continue to decrease as more and more people put in uh, low flow toilets and other types of fixtures as mandated by uh, the Fresno Municipal Code as well as uh, the California Plumbing Code. And how that translated into citywide demand is that from 2008 to 2015, there was a decrease of oh, almost 60,000 acre feet per year in the demand. And to give a perspective on what an acre foot is, um, it's the amount of water it takes to water an acre with one foot of water. So there's about two acre feet in an Olympic pool, Olympic sized swimming pool. There's 500,000 acre feet in Millerton Lake, I think a million in uh, Temperance Flats Reservoir, just to give you a perspective of the amount of water that we'll be using. Now, all those conservation measures have gotten us pretty low to 110 acre feet per year in 2015. It's gone up slightly since then. And we expect it to continue to rise with population growth. 
So to meet those demands, we have three sources of water, one being groundwater. And the, the groundwater you can both think of as sustainable yield. The sustainable yield is the amount of water we can pump out without dropping the groundwater level. And that water you get from natural inflows, so water falls in the mountains, it drips into the groundwater, and it starts to flow underneath us into our groundwater reservoir. As well as, you know, the, the recharge we'll get from rainfall, the, uh, when people landscape, some of that goes into the groundwater, all those types of things. As well as some additional groundwater recharge we'll get from our, our recharge activities that we have at Leak Acres, as well as some of the flood control basins we have throughout the city. In terms of surface water, we have two sources of surface water. One is through an agreement with the United States Bureau of Reclamation. We have 60,000 acre feet of class one water per year. Um, of course, that number does go down during drought years like it has this year. We also have an agreement with the Fresno Irrigation District that allocates some of the Kings River water to us based on percentage uh, of the city within the Fresno Irrigation District. So we make up about 25% of Fresno Irrigation District. So we get about 25% of the water they get from the Kings River. Lastly, we get water uh, from our recycled water uh, facilities. We have two of those facilities. One uh, is in the Southwest at the uh, regional uh, wastewater treatment facility. Uh, and that provides water to our purple pipe network. And another one is on the north side of Fresno. Uh, and that provides water primarily to Copper River Ranch Golf Course. So we take a look at the numbers now. So our demand, again, it, it was hit its uh, bottom kind of 110 acre feet per year. It's grown since to 124,000 acre feet per year. We put a little buffer on top of that uh, to provide us some flexibility. We may be off in the numbers. So we get to a number of 136,000 acre feet per year. And then we look at the, if we have the supplies to match it. So first, we look at our groundwater, what our sustainable yield is. About 73,000 acre feet per year. Uh, we have been recharging as much as possible during wet years, and we've decided this year not to allocate any water from that storage for use of the city. Um, from the uh, United States Bureau of Reclamation, so class one water users are getting about 20% of their allocation this year, so 60,000 is usually what we get. 20% of that is 12,000, plus we have some carryover, a little over 5,000 from last year, and that's how we get to that 17,000 acre feet uh, this year. And then that FID contract allocation, typically we get somewhere in the range of 120 to 140,000 acre feet. It has been reduced again because of the drought conditions uh, to 49,000 acre feet. That's adjusted throughout the year. Just two weeks ago, they projected that to be 51,000. So they'll make little adjustments throughout the year um, and then for recycled water, it seems like a low amount. It's 2,000 acre feet. Um, but when I look at the total supplies, 141,000, and the total demand, uh, 136, we have the supplies to meet the demand, and that 2,000 that comes from recycled water actually is very important in these drought-like conditions. So you can't see it right on the bottom. It's a little cut off, but the supplies by the demand is 104%, and that's something to, to remember uh, when we talk about the water shortage contingency plan. So we did a similar uh, assessment, not just for 2021, but projecting 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, looking at normal years, looking at drought years, looking at a five-year drought. And the big message is, is that the city is able to meet all these types of demands with the existing uh, water supplies and facilities that we have. And the reason we're able to do this is because of 30 years of planning from the Department of Public Utilities. That planning had led to the the startup of the Northeast Surface Water Treatment Facility in the early 2000s. At planning led to a lot of recharge efforts as of, uh, as of late and that are continuing going in the future. That planning led to opening uh, a starting operation of the Southeast Treatment Water uh, Facility. And that allows us that when we have wet years to use as much of the surface water as we can, we weren't always able to do that. And that allows our groundwater aquifer to rest. And then during dry years, we can start calling on all that groundwater that's rested, all that recharge that we've done. And again, we always try to tap out all the recharge facilities we have to, re to, to recharge the groundwater as much as possible to be able to survive those longer droughts. Can I ask a question on the previous slide? Uh, this one? The one you were just reading off of with oh. the dry and the wet. There you go. Main takeaway, the city is projected to meet all demands during a single normal year, single dry year, and five-year drought with the existing water supplies. So... If 
we continue uh, major drought from here on out yep. till 2026, I shouldn't expect to have any water turned off in any of our parks or center median islands. Is that correct? Possibly. That so those, the way those, we'll, are, those we'll, are our demands. Yeah. Right? So so the so, the, so I'll let me answer that one. So if you look at, at the slide, the one that was previous for that, you saw that there is zero allocated from groundwater storage. What we would start to do is start pulling water from from what we've stored over the past several years. Um, and then also what we're trying to do is offset some of the water that we would use in the parks with recycled water. So, I mean, that's a big effort that we've been, we've been going through these past few years. I would not expect it. Um, we could do that's those. That's what your slide says. I know. I yeah. would not expect it mm -hmm. over the next five years, if we have a five-year drought, to turn any of those things off. We would instead maybe ask the public to reduce watering of the residential uh, landscape from three days a week to two to one. So there would be a reduction. How, however, I, uh, he actually, he did, Michael did bring up a, a good point. We are still required to, to follow state mandates. And sometimes the state's more restrictive than we are here in the city. So I think there was an issue that one of the council members brought up previously with medians, about watering of medians that happened in the last drought. We didn't need to do that, but the state mandated that. And what we did was put a priority, I believe, on trees, to try to save as many trees as possible. And so we would have to follow the state mandates, but we would work with the different communities to make sure that we're trying to preserve as many city assets, green assets as possible. So just to make sure I understood it, uh, technically speaking, we would have sufficient water during a five-year drought, mm -hmm. but the state may mandate a reduction of water use in uh, order to mm -hmm. meet its own, you know, statewide water metrics. Yeah, or, or, or uh, s specific activities at that Correct. as well. Yeah. And to your point, how many of our parks right now use recycled water? Uh, so primarily the water is going to Roding Park, but there was a memo that was put out by uh, the city manager as well as uh, Director Carba Hall. Um, indicating the amount of, uh, of new places that we're looking at, at, at providing recycled water. And those include uh, Fulton Street, Fink White Park, some Caltrans locations, many Fresno Unified locations, so Chuck Chansey Park. So looking at this list in terms of parks, city parks, it'll be at the moment limited to Roading Park and Fink White Park, but we're looking to expand our recycled water uh, infrastructure to extend to more city Do we parks. use recycled water in front of City Hall? Uh, that is on the feasibility study right now. So it's not yet to that point, but we're hoping to do so within the next year, correct? Uh, with the construction of our recycled water pipeline that just was able to make it into the downtown. So Inyo Street, I'm sure you saw the construction over the past year. Part of that construction included the, uh, a recycled water line that went through that and has now provided access for the whole downtown area to recycled water. And we're hoping many of these feasibility studies are within the downtown area that we're hoping to connect up. So city manager, I, I would highly encourage and prefer that prior to expanding recycled water to additional parks that we first showcase the recycled water at City Hall. I can and we use our green lawn in the front, demonstrate to the public that it's safe, it's reliable, it works, prior to uh, putting into neighborhood parks because we're gonna spend a lot of time clarifying facts for people mm -hmm. um, if, if we don't have a demonstration site that is accessible to everyone. And yes, and then um, so we, we're 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 on board with that. Another one that we're looking at and discussing is with the uh, the baseball stadium, and the, whatever we wind up doing there with the turf, and just using the recycled water as there as well for that facility. Uh, speaking of which, did we figure out? Um, I know we've been watering the sidewalks at the stadium. Oh yeah, we figured it out. Sorry, thank you out. for bringing it to our attention. Yeah, they had some valves broken, and so they're going to go and get it fixed. Thank you. Real quick, since we're on that topic, my apologies. You mentioned Caltrans. What's the status of that? The status right now is it looks like they're still within their feasibility study. So there's a lot of requirements, there's a lot of state oversight when we use recycled water. Um, and so in terms of Caltrans, I think it's limited mostly to the 180 section on the west side, uh, west of the 99, correct? Uh, and so that's currently where we have the infrastructure uh, available and so we're hoping to water all that. Again, as we start moving uh, recycled water pipeline throughout, throughout the city, we're hoping to provide more and more uh, uh, of that recycled water to other Caltrans locations. Thank you. All right, any additional questions, uh, Council? There's, there's a few more uh, 
slides. Okay, uh, that was basically it on the urban water management plan, so thank you for your feedback there. Um, the, the, the second item is very brief. It's a water shortage contingency plan. And so that details how the city intends to respond should we ever have a water shortage uh, event. Um, it could be foreseeable, drought, a prolonged drought. It could also be something that's catastrophic an earthquake or some other type of event that prevents us from meeting the demands. And so the way that we respond depends on the amount of water that we're short. And so you can see that there's shortage stages, starting with uh, shortage stage number one, where we only have, we're, we're less than 10% short on the water, all the way up to an extreme event, such as a shortage stage five, where we don't have, we can't meet half of the demand of the city. And so the response uh, actions that we have is actually we've incorporated many of them into the Fresno Municipal Code, uh, during the previous uh, drought, which has actually really reduced the amount of demand that we have for the city, and it's been very helpful for planning purposes. There's demand reduction actions. I've mentioned one of them, uh, reducing uh, landscape uh, irrigation for uh, uh, residents uh, from three days a week to two days a week to one days a week, and there's other actions that could be taken. There's supply augmentation. Those could be transfers that we can get in terms of surface water from the United States Bureau of Reclamation's uh, Central Valley Project. There's also uh, uh, emergency interconnections. We have one with the city of Clovis. So if they're in an emergency, we can provide them water and vice versa. Uh, and then the, lastly, there's internal operational changes. So sometimes when we flush wells, the ways we, we work within the water division, as well as the way other departments work when they use their water, we can make changes to try to conserve as much as possible. And then lastly, the water shortage Conceit plan provides uh, a lot of detail on how we communicate to the public. With each stage, there's, a, there's more and more communication that we try to get out there to educate the public on what they need to do to work as a community to, to meet the challenges of a water shortage uh, event. To the catastrophic event, what, what's our contingency plan if the Southwest Regional Wastewater Treatment you know, goes offline? It, one more time, say one. If the Southwest Regional Plan was to go offline, what's our contingency plan? Hey, I just want to just clarify. The 100 million gallon per day wastewater plant out on Jensen, if that goes out, yeah, that can't go out of service. I mean, that just, so like, you know, one of the big There's projects no that Mike identified for you guys that you're working on is that, uh, that um, transmission main that delivers water to there, it collapsed. I mean, that is a vulnerable point right there. So that's why he's making the investments to make sure the infrastructure to get it there. It's why it's got redundant power. It's got reliability and redundancy at every stage. The city manager, the in, in a worst case scenario, we had a little bit of a shake up the other day with an earthquake. If that was to occur and, and the plant in West Fresno goes down, what, what, what happens in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, the sewage is just gonna, is it the north trunk that feeds the that's correct. The North Avenue trunk main did have a, a failure, and so there's a repair uh, plan. We will have a construction project to fully repair that. And we just today, the city council did approve a contract to expand uh, CCTV inspection of our large diameter sewer trunk mains. So we're going to take a, start taking a more thorough and closer look at those pipelines to make sure that they're in good condition to provide service, as well as some of the events that you're talking about. So you typically what happens, so this would happen like in the East Coast, hurricanes, tornadoes, those kinds of things, wastewater plants get wiped out. Mm -hmm. What you wind up having happen, it's, it's different for us, is you just bypass the wastewater plant and you're just releasing raw sewage into the local water body. It just, it's just how it is. They just shut the gates, plants right. offline, and everything goes around to the river. We don't have a river to discharge to, so what will happen is it will just fill up all of the trunk mains. It, 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 I'm just telling you, council member, that is a yeah. that is a hard one to envision so, for us. And, and for it, example, uh, just this week, the Hyperion uh, wastewater plant spilled 17 million gallons of raw sewage to the ocean, and the beaches are closed uh, yeah. for swimming right now. So that's the contingency plan for us. We don't discharge to a waterway. We've got a couple thousand acres of, of, of percolation ponds. And so in the event, we would spill to those ponds, and uh, there's not a very good recovery plan to get it back out of those ponds. Right. So it, it's, it's extremely critical for us to protect the buffer that we have around the wastewater treatment facility, because worst case scenario, we would basically have open sewage in that yep. whole area. Correct. Good to know. <laughs> right. Any other doomsday scenarios we want to contemplate while, while we're at it here, colleagues? All right, seeing no more questions. Uh, we do have one um, speaker that wanted to speak on this, Mr. Eric Payne. You wanted to address the council on this matter. You have three minutes, sir. Or we could just give uh, Brian really quick uh, 
seconds to sanitize. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, good evening, council members. I'm Eric Payne with the Central Valley Urban Institute. I'd like to thank uh, George Ann White for lending her expertise in our conversation with Director Carbajal um, as we uh, discussed um, the issues that we brought forward during the budget conversations um, and uh, for taking the time to discuss our position and relative to our concerns uh, that were expressed. Um, one, let me just say that it's great to see the City of Fresno and Department of Public Utilities is thinking creatively um, about making sure our community has access to enough water. Uh, water is vital, especially for kids' health, um, for their muscles, joints, and tissues, their digestive system, and keeping their growing bodies hydrated. Um, that's why it's so important that children have access to safe drinking water. In addition to making sure our kids have access to enough water, um, I also encourage you to do what you can to make sure the water they are drinking is safe and free of lead contamination um, with use, utilization of the American Relief Act funding dollars uh, for your consideration. Um, unfortunately, lead contamination is widespread. Um, according to the latest data here in Fresno County, one quarter of all reporting schools found lead in the drinking water. Lead is highly toxic and even in low levels can harm kids. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, in children with low levels of lead exposure have been linked to damage to, to control uh, the central nervous and peripheral nervous systems, learning disabilities, shorter stature, impaired hearing, and impaired formation and function of blood cells. In fact, public health agencies are unanimous that there is no safe level of lead for our children. The solution is to remove lead-bearing parts from drinking water systems, from service lines to faucets and fixtures, and installing filters certified to remove lead at every tap used for drinking or cooking. Fresno Unified has taken action and installed a hydration station and water bottle filtering stations equipped with point-of-use filters certified to remove lead at every elementary school in this district. This is great news for our kids. However, we should be doing even more to proactively uh, replace more taps used for drinking, like drinking uh, fountains on playgrounds and at our local parks. I encourage the city to follow the lead of Fresno Unified and install lead-filtered hydration stations at parks and community spaces across the city to make sure our community and our children have access to safe drinking water where they play and grow. Thank you for your time, council members. Thank council you President, if, yes. if I can have the city manager confirm, um, I recall the council approved installation of hydration stations in all the community centers and parks as part of the COVID resources. Has that project, those projects been completed? I know it's, we finished City Hall. I've seen them done at City Hall. Have we finished them at the parks and community centers? I'm going to need to get you a trade memo on that. So let me get you updated on that. I'll get with the parks and the public works folks. But I know that they were doing, they were using the CARES Act money for yes. improvements at the parks facilities. I just, I know there was HVAC yeah. disinfection. I'll check on the water hydration. I believe they have, Councilman yeah. Myers. But it did include hydration problem. stations. So if you can just get us an update, because yep. um, I think we did take care of it last year, but it's taken some time to implement. Yep. Do we have a motion for this item? A second? So move. Seconded. All right, motion made by Councilman Ardia, second by Councilman Maxwell. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. All right, let's uh, take a lunch break and then uh, city attorney, when we come back, we'll do closed session. Uh, do we have to announce that now or when we come back? Uh, announce it now. Let's announce it now. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we have uh, potential litigation concerning Fryant Water Authority, uh, existing litigation with Shell Oil Company, uh, potential litigation against uh, Lyles Construction, uh, real property negotiation concerning 2004 North Van Ness. Also, uh, existing litigation concerning the Krasnick case. Uh, conference labor negotiator concerning all bargaining units and, and uh, Unit 2. Uh, potential litigation concerning Yvonne Spence. And also, public employee evaluation and negotiation concerning city clerk.
Thank you.
Thank you.
15. Before we get started, we've got one last item left. It's a public hearing to receive input from the community regarding the redrawing of election district boundaries. I think this is our third update. Before we do that, City Attorney, uh, Katie, I believe you have an announcement to make. Yes, on item 5C, the council has authorized filing a workers' comp subrogation action against Lyle's Construction. Thank you for that. City Manager, you wanted to make an announcement as well? Yes, I want to just kind of update council on uh, some discussions we had with the uh, individuals, Ms. Martinez and uh, folks she was, she was with here in the chamber today. Uh, during the course of the discussion, we had received some information. Is the from audio not on, guys? Yes, we can hear you, uh, Council Member Corbazzi. Yeah, so during the course of the meeting, we had received some information from our housing uh, partners that they had some rooms available that they could make available to the group. We had HSPs talk with those individuals. Uh, he passed around a notepad for them to give the name, uh, their location where they are now, and the phone number, and it indicated we were going to prioritize them for housing, and we could do that today. Um, and as they passed around the sheet, uh, it, the book, the document round up in uh, Ms. Martinez's uh, possession, and uh, she had asked, uh, where are they going to be located? We said, in one of the facilities that we have. Um, she folded up the paper and came back into the chambers, and they declined to uh, take housing at this time. So we'll need to, th that our offer still exists with them, so if they want to send us those names and addresses and phone numbers, we'd be happy to try and find them a location again. But well, they actually declined housing. Right. They did not take us up on our offer. All right. Well, now we know next time they come. Is that because the rooms that were offered, you were splitting up the couple? Because they believed there was a couple. And what I got told was that we were unable to offer the couple a room. So what you guys were doing was separating the couple. We had... Uh, we we had... Told. We had rooms available for uh, the individuals that had raised their hand and had signed, but we didn't get into that level of detail. We just were at, at the point where we indicated the location was going to be at one of our turning point facilities that we, the, our home key program. The, fold, the paper was folded and the people came back into the chambers. Well, all we can do is offer, City yep. Manager. That's basically, you and, know. It's and City Manager, if, if I just may remind the public that um, when we're housing the unsheltered, we unfortunately cannot accommodate everyone with a private room or the perfect arrangement. We went from early on one motel room per person to up to four people per you know motel room. As much as um, we try to accommodate couples and family members, um, there is limited space. So um, unfortunately, you know we can do the best we can, and if they need housing, then they know where they come for help. And um, we'll offer still again. open. We're offer still open. So they want to get in touch with us. We'd be happy to try and accommodate them. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, get on to our final item. It's the 615 public hearing to receive input for the from the community for, regarding the redrawing of the election district boundaries. And with that, I will open up the public hearing. The first time I'm using uh, <laughs> the the gavel. By the way, it, it, it's brand new and it's only July. So it only took us seven months to get. That's nice. To, to this point. But show, show, show the public. That's oh, very oh, shiny. Oh. That's very beautiful. Uh, I think the previous president um, stole it. And so it ended up going missing, and I just never found it. Paul took it? No, it was uh, the previous president. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I plead the fifth. Regret not being the, there in person to see that, the gavel. That, that shall remain nameless. Yeah. Um, so with that, um, I believe we got a presentation, but I'll turn it over to our uh, my colleagues. I know they've been working hard with our consultant with our staff. So I think Council Member Arias, you've been uh, working on this uh, project. We'll be doing a quick overview and then we'll have a PowerPoint presentation by the gentleman. Uh, Council President, I'm just gonna ask a, a little bit to do the public hearing a little differently than most times. I'm gonna ask that we allow public comment first so that the consultant can um, listen to any comments that are made and he can potentially answer some of those questions as part of his presentation. So if we can allow for public comment first, that'd be great. And secondly, I just want to thank the community for the input that we've received thus far, and for my council colleagues, Maxwell and um, Esparza, who've been um, in committee meetings with our city staff, uh, Mr. City Manager Georgian White, and others. Um, this is a mammoth uh, body of work in a very short period of time with ever-changing timelines, because we are at, um, have to respond to the federal and state timelines that are given to us. So um, I ask for your patience as we work through this, but I am confident that after you, the council sees our presentation and the public recognizes the amount of public outreach that we'll be conducting, 
that the city of Fresno would have conducted the most comprehensive outreach um, and engagement of any municipality in the Central Valley, and that's a high standard that we've set for ourselves, and thankfully the council has committed sufficient resources in the budget process to allow us to engage in this kind of broad outreach. With that, um, I'll ask that we take public input at this time. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, city clerk, who do we have uh, queued up to speak on this uh, item? Who's the first person? We have no public comment. No public comment. Oh, uh, Mr. Payne, would you like to come up and speak? Okay, that's, that, that's all right. We know who you are. We'll just enter your name into the record. Um, Eric Payne, Executive Director of the Central Valley Urban Institute. We are um, a part of a coalition of 40 African American led CEOs from across the state of the Cal across the state of California um, who have engaged in the redistricting process uh, with California calls. Um, and so we currently um, are here to listen. Uh, we'd love to hear what the staff presentation and what the subcommittee has um, uh, decided to do relative to public engagement and outreach. Um, we look forward to participating in this process with the city um, along with um, our partners. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Um, city Clerk, anybody uh, queued up while we're speaking? All right, well, why don't we let the, the gentleman, if, you, if the committee's okay with that, go through the PowerPoint while some folks come to the meeting and perhaps uh, log in through Zoom. So, floor is yours. Dr. Telten, the floor is yours, and thank you for coming today. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me here tonight. Uh, we're going to go through a series of slides that will hopefully give you um, a high-level overview of the redistricting process as it relates to the city of Fresno. The, the process um, is very robust, and this is just the beginning. This is the first mm -hmm. of uh, eight, at least eight public hearings. Um, the initial hearings are all held before uh, draft maps are submitted for, for your consideration. Uh, you can see that the first one obviously is tonight and we go all the way through to uh, what we call a triple header affectionately on uh, Saturday, October 16th and we'll move uh, throughout the, the city limits of Fresno on that particular Saturday for, for those three particular hearings. And I'm gonna talk about uh, our intent uh, with those particular public hearings. Um, we've all been dealt with delays in many of our lives in a lot of the things that we do, including the census. And while we um, would love to have been in a better position to assist with the redistricting process, we're held hostage to when the data will arrive uh, from the feds and also when it is filtered through the state of California uh, because the state of California will take the, the national census data and then adjust it based on prisoner population. And what, am I, what I mean by that is um, any uh, inmate that is in a state prison that's previous address was in the city of Fresno, that data will come back to the city of Fresno. So everything that I talk about tonight, all the way up until we receive those particular data in the beginning or, or middle of October, will be uh, in the light of estimated data. So it will change. We just don't know how much it will change and that's statewide. And then after uh, that October 16th uh, public hearing, we will be able to submit draft maps. Anybody could submit a draft map now, uh, but NDC, National Demographics Corporation, or any member of the city staff cannot submit a, uh, a, a draft map uh, until there's, there's a waiting period until after that California data are released. Um, so there is a deadline for the November 4th public hearing where you will be able to consider the, the first series of draft maps. And those draft maps uh, will have to be submitted by October 21st and then posted to the city's website and the city staff know all of this information. Posted to the city's website by October 28th for uh, the November 4th hearing. We will ask council to pare down those draft maps to maybe two or three as we head into the fourth public hearing but that doesn't mean the public uh, cannot submit additional maps. We actually encourage the public. In fact, we really want the public to submit maps, not that the maps will all come from NDC. NDC will submit two or three maps for consideration, but we would rather have a community member's uh, name behind a, a submitted map, um, just because they'd be involved in this, this great process. And then you would adopt the map at the second reading of an ordinance in December, because December 15th is your deadline. 
So it's a really tight window. Um, it may not seem like it. It may seem like it's a long way out. Um, but your, your deadline is December 15th. And we'll get there. We'll get there. And we're here to help you with that. In order to be able to submit legal draft maps, as we like to call them, authors of maps or anybody who is taking into consideration a map must follow the federal laws. And in the column to the left, uh, each of the districts must be an equal population. Now, there can be some deviation. Uh, it's almost impossible to get uh, truly equal, uh, but you know, that's the ideal. Um, we must follow the Federal Voting Rights Act, and there can be no racial gerrymandering. Now we're going to shift to California's criteria for cities, and it has to go in hierarchical order as it appears in this middle column. <clears throat> the maps must be geographically contiguous. Uh, the, the neighborhoods and communities of interest cannot be divided, and I'll talk a little bit more about communities of interest soon here. Uh, we need to be able to have easily identifiable boundaries. You know, here we have uh, just being a Central Valley boy, you know, I can recognize an identifiable boundary. For me, would be Highway 91, uh, 99, 41, 180, 168. You know, those are Shaw, you know, these, these things that I could visibly see as ident easily identifiable boundaries or parks or lakes, school district boundaries, uh, et cetera, or school attendance boundaries here in, in the city. And they must be compact. That means that the districts can't just go and reach into another district to grab uh, folks just so they can make the, the, um, the, the, the district equally populated. Um, what is prohibited is uh, the districts in this whole process rather shall not favor or discriminate against the political party. If we're able to, any author is able to draft maps successfully answering yes to number one, the column on the left, and the middle column, then they could consider the column on the right. But columns one and two, the one on the left and the one in the middle, are really paramount in the direction that we're going. So a big part of what we're doing between now and that triple header on October 16th, all, all the way now, submitting emails, submitting uh, uh, phone calls to staff, et cetera, it, with counsel, Part of the robust outreach program that's, that's going to be uh, part of this process is helping define the neighborhoods of Fresno. What are they? Uh, what are their geographic boundaries? And I mentioned some uh, as a teaser a few minutes ago, like highways or you know, parks and things like that. And I also said public testimony is, is, is uh, highly welcome in lieu of coming to a, a council hearing and, and for public testimony, et cetera. There could be planning records. The general plan could be used as a point of data for as we triangulate what um, we're looking at in drafting maps. Same with communities of interest. What are the geographical areas? Are, are there particular areas where we're finding uh, a, a high concentration of renters, um, a high concentration of those that may not have high school diplomas to those who might have uh, advanced degrees, et cetera? So you, we're asking members of the community to tell us your story. What is your community? And then there's a question that would the community benefit from being included within a single district for the purposes of its effective and fair representation or with it like multiple representation? I once lived uh, in a retirement community and um, I know the folks in our retirement community, it was a rather large retirement community that uh, we did not want to have single representation from our council. We wanted to have more than uh, rep uh, single representation, so we had a, what we felt was a stronger voice when it came to the direction of the city. And again, the definition of communities of interest may not include relationships with political parties, incumbents, or political candidates. So I'm leaving this blank, and I did this on purpose because this is really a blank slate for us to fill out. When I say us, all of us that are involved in this process, council, the outreach uh, uh, firm that's going to, uh, we'll, we'll talk about later, or council we'll talk about later, the subcommittee, um, folks in the community who want to submit any, anything about what is their possible neighborhoods. We spent the last couple of nights, uh, the outreach firm that I, that I normally work with, uh, with, and last night was Fresno County. Um, it, it, we just we filled up a list that that they helped define what are the communities of interest in the county of Fresno. I mean, so this this particular sheet, and I hope I hope it'll become multiple slides. That
that will help, help and counsel and form because council is going to have to memorialize this as part of the new Fair Maps Act. Dr. Tilton, if I may, um, yes. council, as, as you noted, uh, when we have those three meetings in that triple header Saturday, one of the goals is to have the neighborhoods and those communities self-define what their neighborhoods are. I think Councilwoman Sawyer and I can argue for days where Tower begins and where it ends, and everyone else could you know, self-define where Fresno High neighborhood begins or ends, but the idea is to allow residents themselves to self-identify their respective neighborhoods and for them draw those communities of interest. So it's gonna be a very interactive activity and a very engaging process so that everybody can self-identify neighborhoods. If you associate with the high school or with GM, uh, um, boundaries of freeways or a park nearby, that's all gonna be up to the residents directly and then we'll take that feedback. That's correct, and it's a great process. I'm really enjoying the, the work that we're doing right now in the various communities and jurisdictions. So at this point, I'm gonna share with you the mapping tools that will be available for uh, anybody that wants to submit maps. Um, they, they could draw a map on a napkin. We'll accept that and uh, we'll put it together and do our best to, to represent their thoughts uh, and, and uh, honor their authorship. Uh, one of the first tools, it's just a simple map review tool. There's no uh, development with it. It's basically all the draft maps that we received we place it on this particular uh, Esri tool. It's, uh, it's something that's available easily through like a Google or any, any, um, uh, any, any uh, a browser. We'll be able to pull this up. All the maps are, will be, to, you can see a column to the right that they would be able to click a, a map or a variety of maps and, and layer them and just see how uh, they are drawn based on what the author submitted. We also have just simple uh, a paper map that folks can use. The, um, the community, this particular example is Lake Forest. We don't have uh, Fresnos quite yet, but we will. It, it is broken up into population units, and essentially in those population units, there is a number, and that number represents the number of residents in that population unit. And it's essentially simple math or a calculator. They would add up all those that they colored in as they defined as their particular districts and try to come up with the equal population um, among the five, or excuse me, seven districts. It's similar to the one I just showed you. This one now uses an Excel file. Instead of the total population in the population units, those population units have an identification number. No, no two numbers are the same. So ba basically they take a population unit they drop it into the Excel file that, and they say what district do they want that population unit to go into and all the math is done for them. All the demographics are laid out for them. And again, I want to reiterate, all the work that's done going forward until we get that data, uh, until we get those data in the middle of October, beginning of October, are purely just estimated data. But we want to engage folks to get part of the practice because again, we don't know how much difference it's going to be once we get the adjusted prisoner account from the state of California. There's a, a system that, uh, that's available. Uh, we, don't, uh, we provide it as a courtesy. It's, it's called District R. It's, a, it's a, a program that is managed by Tufts University. It's a project that they have. Uh, it's a nationwide project. Um, the only issue here is it's only available in English. It's like a coloring uh, piece of software. Basically, you take a paintbrush and you just paint over the uh, census tracts, uh, and you can define what you believe as your communities of interest, um, and then save it and submit it, and we'll turn it into a draft map. And if you're really uh, computer savvy and you want to really, you have a lot of time and patience and a high skill level, we have uh, Calipers Maptitude. Um, it's a very robust system. Um, it, the nice thing, it comes in six languages. Uh, and then we also have quick start guides, and I don't know if the uh, demonstration videos are up on the, on the city's website yet, but we have demonstration videos for this particular one, and the uh, district R, the one I just showed you before. Speaking of the district, uh, excuse me, speaking of the website, uh, redistrictfresno.com is the key website for this process all the way through for the next 10 years, in fact. All the data that we are working on going forward must reside on this website for the next 10 years. <clears throat> All the work, everything that's submitted, 
community comments, draft maps, everything. And I want to go back to the draft maps. Every, every draft map that is submitted uh, will go before council. Um, and uh, we're going to actually ask for authors of the draft maps to uh, write their name, their contact information on there. And purely so we can get a hold of them if we have any questions. Um, the, the draft maps will not come to council with the author's name on them. It'll come likely with a number, uh, but uh, the, the author doesn't necessarily, will not have recognition uh, basically on the draft map. Uh, it will be public record, however. Uh, so they can also call uh, the, the, the phone that's on the slide here and also redistrict at uh, fresno.gov. So the work that we're looking at over the, the next couple of months is through this public hearing and discussion or any, any workshops that we might have out in the community are to answer those three questions above. And then when it comes to October 16th, we would like to walk away with a robust list or a, uh, a list of what are the communities of interest in the city of Fresno, what are those neighborhoods, so we can bring it back to council. And when we're considering maps, uh, when we get those two draft, uh, excuse me, when we get those draft maps before council on those two public hearings, that we have these particular data points to consider. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, City Clerk, do we have anybody wanting to speak from the public as of now? Okay. Councilman Barrios. Thank you, Council President Dr. Tilton. I just want to reemphasize a couple of points. One is, as you've seen from the presentation, um, your language is not going to be a barrier to engaging in, the, in this redistricting process. Every public hearing will have translation services, and the community meetings will have multiple language options available. Your ability or inability to have access to the internet will also not limit your engagement. You can do so in a napkin in person, or you can, those who are more sophisticated on the internet can play around with the online map and create their own versions and provide their own input. Um, we have intentionally set up the meetings to take place during council days in the evenings. So thank you council members for, and staff for accommodating the evening schedules to ensure that those that are working can participate. Today we find ourselves with two members of the public doing so in person, and we also scheduled for weekends so those who are working eight to Monday through Friday can also participate in person as close to their neighborhoods as possible. Uh, as I indicated, we are planning um, community meetings. One would be in South Fresno at City Hall. This facility accommodates quite a bit of people. It has all the equipment and technology available to ensure language access and um, active participation. In Central, we are looking to identify potentially Fresno High or Fresno City College as a potential site. And in North Fresno, my colleague, Councilman Maxwell, is going to try and work and secure um, maybe Fresno State or a high school facility that has sufficient space to make everyone comfortable and the equipment necessary to accommodate multiple languages and multiple ways of engagement. So we are working on finalizing those plans. And we're also um, are, have, are going to publish a request for proposals for a firm to do all the outreach. Um, now that we've identified the dates and are securing the locations, once that firm is approved by this body, which we anticipate to be in August, they will get to work to get the word out in all uh, forms of communication, TV, radio, print, social media. Um, we will look to see um, who presents their best foot forward and has the best ideas to do a comprehensive outreach. And my hope is that these communities will have 100 people um, in these chambers providing us feedback and that we have thousands of comments um, on the potential versions of re redistricting. So again, I want to thank the council for accommodating the evening schedules. I know staff has had a long day of a council meeting already, but um, we did hear from the community that they wanted evenings and weekends to be a critical part of this outreach proposals um, and this work. So with that, thank you for the time and I'll answer any questions if the council has them. Um, City Clerk, I think we have somebody online that wanting to speak, is that correct? We do, yes, Marianne. Marianne Cass, is that her last name? Yeah, Ms. Cass, me. can you cue her up? Can you hear me? We can hear you, ma'am, you have the floor. Okay, so I hardly think that uh, putting the first public input meeting at the in the middle of the city council schedule is robust public outreach. 
but it seems to me that at least on the redistrict Fresno website or page, there would be something in big print that says, hey, there's a meeting tonight and you might wish to participate. Further, there would also be a link to join this meeting rather than having to dig through the normal agenda to find the link. Beyond that, the Secretary of State has so easily provided templates for basic information in, I don't know, maybe eight or a dozen or more languages. And I don't see that that is being utilized by the city of Fresno. And I really feel that so far, the process has been quite closed, not a bit at all transparent. And I think that uh, really this first step doesn't um, portend a very transparent process. Does that conclude your comments, ma'am? Yes, it does. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. Anybody else queued up, uh, Brianna? No, not at this time. All right. Uh, colleagues, I don't have any questions. I know this is going to be a series of meetings. Uh, I saw the schedule. Um, I did see the timeline. I think there will be plenty of conversation. Um, and just as a reminder, I mean, this, this, this doesn't preclude, you know, council members from having meetings in their district getting input, additional you know, feedback and, and that sort. So if that's uh, it or anything you want to add uh, to the folks carrying the, the work. I, I would just say thank you for the feedback. We'll make sure that we update the city designated website with the most updated information. And I think that's good feedback. We think we can easily add a link to the live stream. Um, this is a third public presentation update to the public. And I think by the time we're done, we'll at least have 10 of those taking place. Um, so thank you for the feedback, and Council will keep on moving ahead and hopefully providing the public as much engagement and publication opportunity as possible. All right. Thank you to my colleagues for doing the heavy lifting on this. So with that, I will now close the public hearing and conclude there is no action needed today. Yes, th thank you for that reminder. We are adjourning today's meeting uh, in honor of, in memory of uh, Mr. Mo uh, Anunu and uh, Mr. Hortzman. Uh, thank you for that reminder, Vice President. All right, that concludes our meeting. Thank you.